The Washington Post newsroom delivers breaking events around the world as they happen. Unrivaled reporting from the journalists you've come to trust to get the facts fast and meet the challenges of today head on. Get the news that matters most with a special offer by visiting WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing unlocks instant access, bringing you the Post's award-winning coverage anytime, anyplace, because democracy dies in darkness. The sports world was shocked last month when golf's PGA Tour announced it would merge with Live Golf, a rival that is funded by the Saudi Arabian government. Now, Congress is asking questions about how the proposed merger happened, why, who benefits financially, and what it means for human rights. This is live coverage from the Washington Post. Good morning. I'm Libby Casey. Well, Live Golf started a year ago, paid for by the deep pockets of the Saudi Arabian Investment Fund. PGA players were forbidden to join it, and yet some big names did, raking in the money. The PGA had condemned the upstart tour, so the merger caused a shockwave. Let's talk about why with my guests, James Homan, opinions columnist and senior political correspondent Rhonda Colvin. Welcome to you both. James, why is the Senate talking about golf today? Because for the last year, the PGA was begging these same senators to weigh in to help them uh, fight off this challenge from the very deep-pocketed, Saudi-funded Live Tournament. And the, uh, the Live Tournament is part of this trend we've seen globally of sports washing, where a lot of money is spent by some odious regimes, the Saudis, the Qataris, others, to try and improve their reputation and distract from or basically silence criticism of their human rights record. The Saudi... Now, I want, I want to just pause for a moment. You're an opinions columnist, so right. you can use a word like odious, but right. let's talk about why you're saying that. Let's talk about right. what the Saudi Arabian government is accused of and what human right. rights looks like in that I mean, country. They, they, they literally stone people to death, mm -hmm. hundreds of people a year. They treat women as almost subhuman. Uh, they Anyone who criticizes... Uh, the government is arrested, even if it's just a, a social media retweet. Uh, in 2018, according to the U.S. intelligence community, the Saudis, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, uh, authorized and ordered the murder, the assassination of Washington Post contributing columnist Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, the uh, planes that the killers used to fly from Riyadh to Turkey, where they then killed Jamal, uh, were planes that belonged to the private investment fund that is funding LIV. Uh, and Mohammed bin Salman has been unapologetic about these offenses and many more. Mm. So that, you know, there's this question about where the money comes from, concerns about that. But there are also concerns, James, about just who makes the decisions at the PGA and who was saying you can do this, you can't do this. So let's talk about that for a moment. So there's this, the, you know, the PGA Tour was originally formed in the 60s as an association of all the top golfers in the world. They decided to sort of come together and that they could get money by having TV contracts, you know, TV rights, uh, and organize the annual tournament. And this, this new competitor came along and said, you know, we're going to throw money at people. We're going to offer multi-hundred million dollar contracts if you play at our tournaments. Uh, and they struggled to get some of the TV rights, uh, you know, that they have long-term contracts negotiated. And so they were sort of at loggerheads and essentially we don't really know how the deal kind of came together, who approached who. These are questions that we hope to get some answers to today. Uh, but it, essentially a couple guys got together, we know over cigars, and they decided to basically merge. But functionally this is a live slash Saudi takeover of the PGA. Rhonda, let's talk about why this Senate subcommittee is looking at this today and who should we be watching as they question a couple of members representing the PGA. We don't have the big names of the PGA or of LIV, um, but what should we watch out for today? Yeah, so this is the Senate subcommittee on investigations. It's a subcommittee out of the Senate Homeland Security uh, Committee. And, and it's a longstanding committee. They have wide jurisdiction, actually. Uh, they can look into the inner workings of government. They're also tasked at looking into any non-compliance 
defiance of the law. So this uh, potential merger does fit within the realm of what they uh, like to look at. Uh, this committee is often a bipartisan committee. Anytime the, the Senate or the House uh, decides to investigate an outside entity, you often see uh, folks from across the aisle join in that effort. So this hearing uh, is the product of first Richard Blumenthal, who is the chair of the committee. Uh, he sent a letter to the PGA commissioner when this deal was announced, about a week after. It was it really in, in short order, uh, asking for documents because the deal caught a lot of people off guard, caught Congress off guard. You had senators saying that, you know, members of the PGA leadership were meeting with us, you know, weeks and months before, and, and now they've done this deal. Uh, so Blumenthal said he wanted to look into this. He specifically also wanted to look into the tax exempt uh, issues that are raised in this merger. The PGA says they want to continue being a 501, uh, 501c6 tax exempt organization after the deal. Blumenthal said, well, that might give a foreign entity, you know, protections under U.S. tax code. So that's something that they wanted to look into. Then it was announced that they would have this hearing, uh, and the rank, ranking member, the top Republican, Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, he has also joined in this effort trying to look into this. So I would actually listen out for both of those members, specifically Ron Johnson. He's a Republican, a very conservative Republican, certainly someone who's been supportive of Donald Trump, who is very supportive of Live Golf. I, I believe yesterday it was announced that Trump, uh, one of the championships will be at his uh, Florida resort. Uh, Ron Johnson might be someone to listen to because you're going to get a glimpse in how Republicans are taking this issue. Uh, a lot of Republicans on the Hill are saying this may not rise to the level of congressional intervention. Maybe the courts need to take this up. Uh, but Ron Johnson says we need to look into this. He says that he is a golfer. He wants to see how this might affect uh, the actual game of golf and the players. And so he is willing to be that Republican member to look into this. So I would, I would listen out to what he might have to say. Let's bring Washington Post sports writer Mick Mace, Rick Mace, into the conversation. Rick is in the hearing room right now. Rick, I want to just take a step back and tell us how surprising was it when this proposed merger was announced? Well, I think it's hard to understand how surprising it was. I mean, for uh, the, pre the preceding year and a half, um, the PGA Tour derided the Saudis. They, they, uh, they objected to live golf and to any of this foreign investment. And it, uh, it felt almost overnight because all this done was was done completely behind closed doors in secret. Even the top tour golfers had no idea negotiations negotiations were underway. So, it, you know, everyone woke up that day and um, was just shocked to find out that they basically struck a deal with their with their sworn enemies, their rivals. Um, and really, this, well, over a month now has passed, and we still don't have a lot of answers. And a lot of these um, strong feelings and uh, reservations about this deal have not subsided. You know, Rick, you're literally describing a deal that takes place in a smoke-filled room with just a couple of players. How did this handful of men have the power to make such a sweeping decision for all of the PGA? Yeah, and I think we're going to learn more about that today. I think that's going to be a, a key line of inquiry by, uh, by, by the subcommittee. Um, but I, I think that's a, a good question that um, both professional golfers have and also DOJ, uh, Department of Justice, the Antitrust Division. Um, they want to know how it came to be. Um, they want to know who was at the table. And as far as we, we, we know who wasn't at the table, and that was top golfers like Rory McIlroy, Tiger Woods. It was members of the PGA Tour's top policy board, which is their, their top governance body. Um, and it was really just a couple of people, and they just suddenly announced, hey, we, we struck this deal, we're moving forward, with, you know, everything's okay. Um, and I, I think, you know, the weeks that followed showed that maybe it's not okay, and maybe more people want to have a, a voice and a say in, in how things uh, unfold. And, you know, it's, it's worth noting, this deal is far from being finalized. It needs to be approved by this policy board. Um, even if that happens, and there's no guarantee that it will, then the DOJ is certainly going to have something to say with it. The, the, the Justice launched an investigation last year into potential antitrust concerns. Um, over the PGA Tour, and certainly everything about this deal just raises more red flags. Rick, you mentioned uh, Rory McIlroy. Let's listen to what he had to say after the deal was announced. You've galvanized everyone against something, and that thing that you galvanized everyone against, you've now partnered with. So, yeah, of course I understand. It, it, it is hypocritical. It sounds hypocritical. Whether you like it or not, the PIF and the Saudis want to spend money in the game of golf. It is they, they want to do this, and they weren't going to stop. You're thinking about some, you know, one of the biggest sovereign wealth funds in the world. Would you rather have them as a partner or, the, or an enemy? Um, at the end of the day, money talks, and you'd rather have them as a partner. Hmm. Uh, Rick, uh, talk to us about what this potential merger actually means for the golfers, and tell us about who agreed to go with Liv and what consequences they suffered and how. 
there may not be so many consequences after all. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that's another big line of questions. The, the, the whole agreement has raised more questions than answers. The, the, the basic framework of the agreement, it was basically a, a deal to strike a deal, so it was um, very light on detail. Um, you know, we don't know how much money is changing hands. We don't know um, what exactly the, the Saudis want in the end. Um, they, they have a seat at the table, or they, they would have a seat at the table if this thing gets finalized. Um, but I, I think that's one question everyone has. It's like, what does this actually do to the game? Are we going to have... Um, you know, Saudi branded tournaments. Are we going to have championship events? Um, you know, held in Saudi Arabia. Um, how do we go forward? And a lot of the, the tour golfers that remain loyal to the tour that turned down tens of millions of dollars in some cases to stay on the PGA Tour, um, they, they suddenly are going to face with the prospects of playing alongside uh, professional golfers that jump ship that took the, the Saudi money and decided to play with Liv. And I'm thinking of guys like Dustin Johnson, Brooks Kepka, Phil Mickelson, guys that um, you know padded their bank accounts in huge ways, and suddenly there, there could be a path for them to, to return to the PGA Tour. And we don't know exactly what that path is like, if there's penalties, uh, if there's some kind of uh, a compensation for the players that remain loyal. Those are one of the many questions that, are, that have yet to be answered. All right, Rick Mays, thank you so much. He's joining us from this hearing room uh, in the Capitol Complex. Really appreciate your time, Rick. It's so cool to get to talk to the sports reporters who are covering the game, but also what happens behind the game, James. I want to talk about um, the response by people who watch this all unfold because as Rick laid out for us there was this huge brouhaha when Liv first said we're launching we're pulling players in um, talk to us about the perceived hypocrisy from how the PGA Tour reacted to it and how they've now changed their tune. Yeah, uh, Jay Monahan, the commissioner, he really leaned hard into the idea that uh, the 9-11 families were against Live Golf because uh, 15 of the 9-11 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia and found some family members who opposed it. He said he was personally close to them, that this was a principled position, uh, and then has subsequently said he understands being called a hypocrite, but basically the deal was good. And Let, let's actually listen yeah. to what he said to say, because this is something that will come under scrutiny today. This is the PGA Tour Commissioner, and you'll hear what he was saying and then how he changed his tune. As it relates to the families of 9-11, uh, I have two families that are close to me that lost loved ones. And so my heart goes out to them. And I would ask, you know, any player that has left or any player that would ever consider leaving, have you ever had to apologize for being a member of the PGA Tour? They've launched LIV, they've proceeded with LIV, they've made progress with LIV. But ultimately it was looking at the broader picture and saying that I don't think it's right or sustainable to have this tension in our sport and to be able to, to, to organize and orient this in a way where, again, we're in a control position. Uh, we have an investor, a great and world-class investor. And I recognize everything that, you know, that, I've, that I've said in the past and in my prior positions. I recognize that people are gonna call me a hypocrite. That's the PGA Tour commissioner talking before the merger was announced and after the merger was announced. Rhonda, how will Congress be focusing on that today? I, I would suspect that that's going to be one point you're going to hear, specifically from Democrats, is why was there this quick change of heart? And we know from uh, some of the opening statements that the leaders from the PGA intend to say, look, we think the rollout of this announcement was something that we botched, but we still stand by this. Uh, I do want to note that uh, there, there may be members of uh, the 9-11 victims and families groups there today. I have received emails that a group of them will be attending and, and want to shed light on their concerns, as James uh, brought that up as well. So just wanted to make a point about that. Also, the commissioner was in the sights of this uh, committee to come and testify. He is on health leave. That is why the COO is going to be there instead. Uh, and, and as well as the LIV uh, group, their representative said that they had a scheduling conflict today. They so also are not seeing anyone representing You're LIV. not seeing anybody from LIV. However, I will point out that this committee does have subpoena power. So if they want to continue these types of hearings on this issue, they could compel uh, representatives to come. Uh, but for now, uh, the representatives from Live Golf said that they had scheduling conflicts and that they would welcome another date if possible. So we'll see if this continues. So as Rhonda laid out for us, we will hear from the COO, uh, Ron Price. We'll also hear from uh, Jimmy Dunn, a board member of the PGA Tour, James. Yeah, and he was involved in these negotiations. And so he could answer some of those questions Rick was outlining about 
uh, you know, how this all came together, what exactly the terms are, who we're also not hearing from, uh, are, is anyone involved with the, the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, specifically Yasir al-Rumayan, who's sort of the right-hand man of Mohammed bin Salman and really was the driving force behind LIV, and who would basically be playing a leadership role in American Gulf uh, if this withstands antitrust scrutiny and congressional scrutiny. So we will be going to the Hart Senate office building shortly for this subcommittee, a subcommittee that may not be on a lot of people's radar, Rhonda, but you outlined for us how they do have power here. They do have power, and as I said, it's a bipartisan group usually. Now, if you do look at the list of membership uh, of this committee, there are a lot of hardline Republicans, conservative Republicans. You have uh, Rick Scott of Florida. He's on this committee. Josh Hawley, as I mentioned, Ron Johnson is the top uh, ranking member. So I do think we're going to get a clearer view of how Republicans feel about that. And this is important because Democrats have been saying, we want to look into this. Uh, there are human rights abuses, the association with 9-11. But Republicans are a little cooler on that idea, saying this is not an issue for Congress. So if there was anything to come out of this, say legislation to address uh, sports washing or uh, tax-exempt status, would that pass in a bipartisan fashion? So that's why it's important to listen out to what the Republicans might be saying in this hearing, specifically because they are very conservative Republicans in this group. You know, Donald Trump is hosting, as Rhonda mentioned a bit ago, the Live Finals, but also uh, West Virginia Governor Jim Justice, a billionaire, owns the Greenbrier. He's hosting a Live tournament that's coming up in the next few months. He's he, the top uh, Republican Senate recruit to run against Joe Manchin next year. Uh, and then one of the questions that we don't know is Live is 93% owned by the Saudis. It's 7% owned by a, a mystery anonymous person. Uh, they have refused to say who it is. There's lots of speculation on Capitol Hill. You know, is it Jared Kushner who got $2 billion from the Saudis for his fund? Uh, there will be questions today about who has that 7%. Uh, and if it is indeed perhaps Jared Kushner or someone else, that could then explain why there's Republican hesitancy to be seen as crossing the former president on this issue. Mm. Well, what power does Congress have when it comes to something like sports washing, Rhonda? I mean, we hear about greenwashing, right, where people, companies try to put a friendly environmental spin on things. Mm -hmm. We hear about sports washing now uh, through things like this, through the sponsorship of major leagues or teams. Um, what does Congress say about this? You know, I, I think a hearing like this is going to raise that issue, it's going to bring it to light, it's going to put the PGA and perhaps other groups on notice, really, because this is a public uh, forum where people are going to be able to watch and hear about this. And specifically, if you do hear, uh, whether interviews or people there who are 9-11 uh, victims or family members, that may, you know, bring to the public that this could be a concerning deal. So, of course, it can be, bring public awareness. When it comes to legislation, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, because for the main reason, are you going to get both sides of the aisle to support something? Uh, but they could address it mainly through that tax exempt issue. I mentioned that that was a part of the letter Blumenthal uh, put out there that he thought it was concerning that this company might be giving some sort of shelter to a foreign entity because they are going to con maintain their 501c6 tax exempt um, status. So you can kind of get it that way. And there is legislation right now that has been drafted uh, to uh, address the tax exempt issue. But, you know, for right now, I think this committee is trying to put groups on notice. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why you're going to hear uh, the COO and also the board member of PGA say that they uh, may have botched the rollout of this announcement, that they are uh, at least yielding a little bit to congressional authority and by coming here and answering these questions. Mm. I want to talk, James, more about sports washing and also the politicization of this. Donald Trump called the announced merger a big, beautiful, and glamorous deal. Um, so you've already laid out for us that he is supportive of this, but how could politics really be injected into the PGA and golf now? Well, you know, the, the uh, politicians love to go to these golf tournaments. Obviously, Trump is a special case because he owns multiple golf courses. But a lot of this whole process of pushing back on sports watching, as people like Richard Blumenthal see it, is the kind of the naming and the shaming, the highlighting who's making big profits off of taking, you know, what they call blood money. Uh, you know, the, some of these senators on this committee on the Democratic side have highlighted that the Saudis are able to make this investment because they've made nearly a trillion dollars over the last year because of elevated oil prices as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The Saudis import Russian oil, which the U.S. is 
blocked from other places taking, and then they, because they control OPEC, they've kept oil production down. So the, they've essentially made all this money and they're using their gains. So part of what Blumenthal wants to do is just highlight that for the American people. That's part of the purpose of today's hearing. Yeah, we're getting images here from this subcommittee hearing room in the Hart Senate office building. There's Senator Blumenthal now, a chairman of the committee. Let's go to the hearing room. for their hard work on the memorandum that we've distributed with documents, which I will put into the record without objection. Today's hearing is about much more than the game of golf. It's about how a brutal, repressive regime can buy influence, indeed even take over a cherished American institution to cleanse its public image. It's a regime that has reportedly killed journalists, jailed and tortured dissidents, fostered the war in Yemen, and supported other terrorist activities, including the 9-11 attack on our nation. Today is about sports washing. It's also about hypocrisy, how vast sums of money can induce individuals and institutions to betray their own values and supporters or perhaps reveal a lack of values from the beginning. It's about other sports and institutions that could fall prey if their leaders let it be all about the money. Perhaps to state the obvious, uh, sports are central to our culture and society. They have huge implications for our way of life, our local economies and communities, close to home and our image abroad. Athletes like the PGA Tour golf players are role models. They are ambassadors of our values and the institutions that concern us today are vital to our national interest. To have them taken over by a repressive foreign regime certainly is a matter of our national security. So we hope that today's hearing will help us uncover not only the reasons for the PGA Tour's sudden reversal of its opposition to the Live Golf takeover and what it means to golf, but also to understand what similar investments by repressive regimes or other countries with deep pockets could mean for our country, for our national security, and for the world. For two years, the most vehement opposition to the Saudi government's taking over the sport of golf in America and the most vehement criticisms of Saudi sport, sports washing came from the PGA Tour leaders themselves. They enlisted fans, sponsors, the 9-11 family, <coughs> Members of Congress, like myself, some of those leaders sat across from me in Cromwell, Connecticut, and asked me to support them, and I did. All on the promise and commitment to maintaining the PGA Tour as an independent, cherished, iconic American institution. And Jay Monahan himself said in June, just a year before June 6, I would ask any player that has left or any player that would ever consider leaving, have you ever had to apologize for being a member of the PGA Tour? The players admirably and heroically stood by the PGA Tour and said no to tens of millions of dollars. Likewise, members of the 9-11 families who are with us today stood by the PGA Tour, and others of us did the same. And then suddenly on June 6, everything changed. The sports world was shocked by the announcement that the PGA Tour 
was entering into an agreement to combine forces with the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund, the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, which owns Live Golf. It's an instrument of the Saudi government. And the deal was not to just take over a team, but the entire sport, not just an individual Saudi investor, but the government of Saudi Arabia. So it was no ordinary investment. The Saudi Public Investment Fund, known as PIF, is closely allied with the very top of the Saudi monarchy, and it is headed by Governor Al Rahman, who was a negotiator and party to this deal. So, understandably, there was a feeling of betrayal among many of the individuals and groups that supported the PGA Tour, including from the players themselves. And we're here today because not only did it raise that feeling of betrayal, and John Rahm, familiar to all of us, said it best. I think the general feeling is that a lot of people feel a bit of betrayal from management. But we're here about questions that go to the core of what the future of this sport and other sports will be in the United States. What happened that led the PGA Tour to change its position? Was it only the hope of ending litigation? Or was it also the unspecified <clears throat> in amount Saudi investment that would come of it? Just how much money did PIF offer the PGA Tour? And what other sources of money were sought as an alternative? Given these questions and their implications, not only for the future of professional sports, but for foreign influence and global human rights, this subcommittee launched an inquiry into this deal. And I've already put into the record the memorandum that we circulated that incorporates the documents that have been produced and some of what we've learned. But clearly, although the agreement itself is seemingly unspecific, vacuous, and simply an agreement to ag agree, we know from it that the Saudi government will have an equity dominance and ownership of this institution through its investment. And we know also that the PGA Tour surrendered once for the Saudi investment of money. And there is no assurance in this agreement that it would not do so again. We've learned from the documents some facts that also indicate that the PGA Tour will be dominated in this agreement. We learned that after rebuffing the PIF as recently as January, the PGA Tour representative reached out to PIF Governor Yasser al Rahman, days after he was told of fears that, quote, the Saudis will double down on their investment, end quote, in live. We learned that Saudi Arabia's early vision for the tour included a team golf tournament culminating in Saudi Arabia, at least one high-profile PGA event in Saudi Arabia, and a global golf investment fund managed by the PIF. We learned that just one night one night before the framework agreement between the PIF and the PGA Tour was signed, the PIF added a non-disparagement clause that appears to prevent the PGA Tour from criticizing Saudi Arabia and applies to the witnesses that are before us apparently today. We learned that, the, that Governor Al Rahman will not only become the chairman of the PGA Tour's board, but he will sit on the executive committee of the new company 
that is to be formed where he will, and this is a direct quote from a document we received, quote, provide PIF with strong influence over the new company. And we learned what is not in the agreement, which may be as important as what is explicitly there, very little is explicit, that there are potential side agreements and understanding. Only in the internal documents re reviewed by this committee did we learn that PGA Tour officials prepared a side agreement providing that Live CEO Greg Norman would be terminated upon execution of the final agreement. We don't know whether this agreement was executed, but there are other documents, such as the talking points that are now in the record for Jay Monahan to talk to the policy board that indicate the parties maintained this understanding about terminating Norman after the agreement was announced. We still don't know whether there are other side agreements or other understandings that may exist or what they might say. We don't know what assets the PGA Tour will place in the new entity or how it will maintain its nonprofit status, certainly a profoundly important question. What assets it gained while it had nonprofit status that may be transferred now to a for-profit entity, raising very serious questions that ought to concern this committee and the Congress. <coughs> and uh, especially since it has indicated that there will be an active commercial role for this new entity. We also don't know what will happen to players who may want to speak out against Saudi Arabia's human rights abuses. They apparently are bound by the non-disparagement clause. The Live Golf Tournament had requirements about wearing apparel. Are they going to have Saudi insignia on their shirts? Are they going to be speaking on behalf of the Saudi government? And we don't know whether LIV will continue to exist after the conclusion of its next season. And if so, what form or under what leadership? And of course, we still don't know how much money, how much money is on the table or was even discussed to prompt the PGA Tour to make this sudden dramatic reversal. My hope is that this hearing will begin answering those questions and that we will learn more as we receive additional documents and have additional hearings. Americans very simply deserve to know what this agreement means for the future of golf as well as for the future of the Saudi Arabian government's investment in sports and other autocratic regimes that may choose to do the same. Because Saudi Arabia has nearly limitless capacity to inject its funds into these endeavors through its nearly 700 billion in assets. And we already know that they have purchased a British Premier League soccer team, two of the largest video game tournament operators in the world, and made investments in Formula One racing, among many other investments. Now, we won't be able to comprehensively address these questions because two witnesses whom we invited couldn't be here today. They had scheduling conflicts. We're working with them to resolve those scheduling issues, and we hope that they will work with us cooperatively. The PGA Tour Chief Operating Officer Ron Price and board member Jimmy Dunn, who are with us today, played a central role in arranging the agreement. And I want to thank each of you for being here. Uh, you are both knowledgeable and prominent members of the PGA Tours leadership. We hope that you will help us to discover some of the reasons for the PGA Tours sudden reversal and other answers to these questions and what the deep pockets of the Saudi government and other regimes could mean to the future of our country and the world. And with that, I will turn to the ranking member for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I also want to welcome the witnesses and, and thank you for appearing voluntarily. 
before our subcommittee. Uh, let me start by saying I love the game of golf. I enjoy playing it. I wish I was a whole lot better, and, and I enjoy watching it. <clears throat> golf is a pure meritocracy. Golfers succeed or fail on their own. Every golfer can empathize with a pro who is trying to execute a difficult shot or sink a crucial putt. We appreciate the moments of celebration, and we sympathize with the failed attempts. The game of golf has developed a handicap system that allows golfers like me at a lower uh, skill level to enjoy competing with one another. But it's the competition at the highest level that brings us here today. Every professional sport faces the exact same challenges. How do you structure and maintain competition to attract large audiences and maximize the revenue base? How do you fairly compensate all the athletes, from the top stars to the journeyman players striving for the top? And in a global environment, how do you accomplish this with entities possessing dramatically unequal resources? League sports in America provide a good example of this dilemma. How can small city markets like Green Bay or Milwaukee afford to field teams to effectively compete against cities like New York, Chicago, or Los Angeles that have much larger fan bases? The solution has been the formation of leagues and governing bodies that develop and enforce the rules of the game and competition. Unfortunately, many of the rules and practices that these leagues uh, engage in may run afoul of the Sherman and, Clant and Clayton antitrust laws. In researching the legislative and judicial history of sports in America, I must agree with the assertion of a 1987 University of Miami Law Review article that states, quote, the precise law governing the relationship between professional sports leagues and the Sherman Act is so noticeably confused and unsettled. A simple explanation for this confusion is that it is difficult to write a law that effectively addresses every situation and every reality. This hearing deals specifically with the reality the PGA Tour faced when Saudi Arabia decided to get involved and invest in professional golf. According to its 2021 990 tax form, the PGA Tour has net assets worth approximately one and a quarter billion dollars. Saudi Arabia's invest, public investment fund is estimated to be worth between six and seven hundred billion dollars, 500 times larger than the PGA Tour. Until the creation of Live Golf, <clears throat> multiple golf tours throughout the world competed in a commercial marketplace dictated by the normal market force of profit and loss. Live is financed by an entity that was committed to competing for top players with little, if any, regard or expectation of a direct financial return. From a commercial standpoint, it's not a fair fight. And the PGA Tour accurately viewed the live as an existential threat. Now, I have the deepest sympathy for the families of 9-11 and support their efforts of obtaining information currently being withheld by the US and Saudi governments. And Mr. Chairman, as a quick aside, I was approached by some members of 9-11 families of the hall today. And they gave me a document that summarizes, uh, I guess, the, the FBI's investigation of Saudi involvement in 9-11. And unlike so many, or like so many documents that I receive, it's heavily redacted. The FBI, the United States government, the Saudi government is not being transparent with the 9-11 families. And I, I want to completely support the 9-11 families in obtaining transparency and the truth. So I, I'd like to enter this document into the record uh, so that people can view for themselves the lack of transparency of our government and the Saudi government. Without objection, and I might just say I have spoken to the 9-11 families about exactly this resistance by our own government, the FBI, and other agencies to provide the facts that are necessary for them to seek simple justice. And I would join you in a bipartisan effort to make those facts more and Hopefully that's a, a really good bipartisan result of, of this hearing. Uh, sports washing is also a legitimate issue. But no amount of money can wash away the stain of the brutal Khashoggi assassination and other human rights abuses. But it would be grossly unfair to expect the PGA Tour to bear the full burden of holding Saudi Arabia accountable. After all, anyone who drives a car or uses oil-based products has helped fill the coffers of the Saudi Public Investment Fund. Foreign investment in the US is generally a good thing. 
And I'd rather have the Saudis reinvest their oil wealth in America as opposed to China or Russia. Also, if the kingdom's involvement in golf and other sports helps it to modernize and offer more rights to women, wouldn't that be a good thing? Although I believe there are many more pressing issues Congress and this subcommittee should be focusing on, like many Americans, I have a great deal of interest in how this issue is resolved. As courts have indicated, Congress does have a legitimate role to play in settling the confusion in the law governing professional sports. That said, I did not sign the request for information or the memo issued by the majority because the parties are in the midst of what should be a private negotiation and there's no deal to review. Inquiries and investigations conducted by this subcommittee generally involve some measure of wrongdoing. There's nothing wrong with the PGA Tour negotiating its survival. Negotiations are often delicate, mostly private, and I fear Congress getting involved at this stage could have negative consequences. But I hope this hearing can be constructive and address the many legitimate questions the public has regarding the future of golf and how to preserve the purity of competition at the highest levels of the game. Although the various parties in this dispute bring different perspectives and objectives to it, my guess is they do share a common love and respect for the game of golf and want to see it succeed well in the future. So again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I thank the witnesses and look forward to your testimony. Thanks very much, Ranking Member Johnson. I'm going to introduce the witnesses and then, as is our custom, swear you in and ask you to speak. We're going to have seven-minute round questions once your testimony is done. Uh, we welcome Ron Price, who's the Chief Operating Officer at the PGA Tour. He has been leading the tour's operations during the absence of CEO Jay Monahan. Uh, by the way, both of you, I hope, will convey to Mr. Monahan our hope for his continuing recovery. We're glad to learn that he'll be back later this month in the job. But in the meantime, you are representing the PGA Tour. Uh, Mr. Price has been responsible for the overall strategy and operations of the PGA Tour, including overseeing championship management, brand communications, golf course properties, finance, legal licensing, and merchandising, as well as talent and culture, board governance, and government relations. Uh, my understanding is you joined the tour in 1994. Yes, sir. Uh, Jimmy Dunn, who is uh, sometimes referred to as a legendary deal maker, uh, served as a member of the PGA Tour Policy Board since January of this year, and he is uh, one of the chief architects of the PGA Tour deal that we are discussing here today. Uh, your name is repeated in many of the key documents. Uh, Mr. Dunn, and we're very glad that you are going to enlighten us as to some of these questions. Uh, he is the vice chairman and senior managing principal of Piper Sandler and was one of the co-founders of Sandler O'Neill and Partners LP and <coughs> independent investment banking firm. Over the past two and a half decades, he has advised on some of the financial industry's largest mergers and acquisitions transaction. Uh, we welcome you and look forward to your testimony. And now, if you would please rise. Do you affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. I do. Thank you. Price, if you could proceed. Thank you. Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the PGA Tour. I serve as the Chief Operating Officer of the Tour and most recently have been co-leading the Tour while Commissioner Monahan is on medical leave. Let me start by saying that our goal is to protect an American institution that along with its tournaments generates over 200 million annually for over 3,000 charities across 34 states and brings the highest level of sports and entertainment to millions of fans around the globe and provides the most pro-competitive, legacy-driven platform for the world's best players. That goal, which is our core mission, 
has been under threat for the better part of two years. When the Saudi-funded Live Golf Tour launched its inaugural series in 2022, the tour faced an unprecedented attack. In defending our organization and its regulations, regulations that each member agrees to at the start of every season, we were forced to suspend players, those players who made the choice to form of the collective membership they left behind. In August 2022, we were sued in an effort to invalidate our regulations. This created a fracture in golf unlike anything our sport had experienced in decades and created a division in our closely knit membership organization. We believe we've done everything we could possibly do to defend what we stand for, including spending tens of millions of dollars to defend litigation instigated by Live Golf. And that's significant funds that were diverted away from our core mission to benefit our players and charity. As part of the litigation, we were successful in securing a court ruling that the public investment fund was not protected under sovereign immunity with respect to litigation discovery and potentially liability. That's something which had never been done before in the United States. Meanwhile, we've seen continued strength of the tour thanks to the loyalty, talent, and performance of the remarkable players we are proud to call members of the PGA Tour. However, it was very clear to us and to all who love the PGA Tour and the game of golf as a whole that the dispute was undermining growth of our sport and was threatening the very survival of the PGA Tour, and it was unsustainable. While we had significant wins in litigation, our players, our fans, our partners, our employees, our charities, and the communities we support would lose in the long run. Instead of losing control of the PGA Tour, we pursued a peace that would not only end the divisive litigation battles, but would also maintain the PGA Tour's structure, mission, and longstanding support for charity. Why negotiations toward a definitive agreement are currently underway. The framework agreement contains important safeguards that ensures the tour will operate fundamentally as it does today. The tour will control its operations. The tour will control the board of the new PGA Tour subsidiary. And the tour will be the governing body for competitive golf in connection with any combined golf operations. The agreement provides clear, explicit, and permanent safeguards that ensure the tour will lead the decisions that shape our future and that we will have control over our operations, strategy, and continuity of our mission. I certainly understand the need for additional clarity around how and why the deal came together. <clears throat> and I welcome the opportunity to shed light on the predicament we found ourselves in one which we did not seek, one that we could not sustain indefinitely, but one for which we found a workable, productive solution that benefits all who love the game of golf and the PGA Tour. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thanks, Mr. Price. Mr. Dunn. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the subcommittee, my name is Jimmy Dunn. And since January of this year, I have served as an independent director on the PGA Tour Policy Board. To hold that position is a real privilege for me. I joined the board at a time of great concern for all of us who love the game of golf. Some players had left the PGA Tour to join Live Golf. Others were under pressure to do the same. The PGA Tour and Live were facing each other in litigation. There is division and tension among players. You could feel it spreading to fans and sponsors. My, my concern was that if it all continued, expensive legal fights, every day wondering which player was going to leave next, a fan base tired of hearing about it, sponsors nervous, golf as we know it would be damaged forever. As board members, we have a responsibility to protect the game. As the situation appeared to me, the tour had to move towards a solution of the differences that were causing way too much disruption. And we had to do it in a way that preserved the standards, 
tradition, and authority of the tour. For that to happen, we needed to act from a position of strength, and we found ourselves in that position in the spring of this year. By April, major court rulings had set back live in its litigation against both the tour and Europe's DP World Tour. It was the right moment to reach out, not only because of those legal victories, but also because of our solid financial condition. We knew that a long-term fight with Liv would be harmful to the players, fans, sponsors, and charities. We wanted to begin the negotiation while we were in a strong position. This would allow us to focus on uniting the game or walk away if that objective was not being served. At the direction of the PGA Tour Commissioner and the Board Chairman, I contacted Yasser Aroman, Liv's majority owner and governor of the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia. A limited number of in-person meetings followed, and, the, and these meetings resulted in the framework agreement of May 30th. As members of this subcommittee know, some agreements are just mutual promises to continue to negotiate. And this describes the framework agreement. The only deal reached in the framework is that the lawsuits among the parties have been settled. Everything else is aspirational. The elements are all there for a final agreement that can serve the interest of the players, fans, sponsors, and charities and unite the game of golf. Since the June 6th announcement, the tour and its advisors have taken the lead in negotiating the final agreement. But what I can tell you is the tour will continue to manage the game, retaining majority governing control, majority economic control. The tour will appoint a majority of the board of directors. The framework would not be possible without the clear understanding that the tour will retain full decision-making authority. Of course, we expect many questions about who we're dealing with. The reality is that because some men from Saudi Arabia were part of the nightmare of September 11th, suspicion has lingered about the complicity of others. For my part, my thoughts turned to September 11th. I remember the 66 friends and colleagues at my firm who died that morning, along with so many others when the towers went down. I think about them all the time. I think about the families, and I think about the grief that never ends. If any person had the remotest connection to an attack on our country and the murder of my friends, I am the last guy that would be sitting at a table with them. If this agreement ultimately succeeds, I have nothing to gain except a sense of pride that we help unite the game we love. I am not in line for a job, a fee, compensation of any kind. My entire concern here is to put this divisive period behind us and for the sake of the players, fans, sponsors, and charities, unite the game of golf once again. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Mr. Dunn. Uh, I'll begin the questions, and we're going to have seven-minute rounds with uh, colleagues as they appear participating. Um, both of you are here speaking on behalf of the PGA Tour, correct? Correct. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Price, you were winning this litigation, correct? Senator, we won some battles, but the litigation was far from over. Well, as Mr. Dunn has said, you were on top, you were winning, and in effect, you made the judgment, maybe it was a business judgment, that the cost of proceeding was too high, and the ultimate agreement involved not only settling this litigation, but also a Saudi investment in a new entity to be created, correct? Senator, we, we really faced a choice. One option was to continue the very expensive, disruptive, and divisive litigation. And we faced a real threat that Lilgolf, which is 100% financed by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, would become the leader of professional golf. And so you decided to take the financing and the investment from Saudi Arabia for this new entity that would also incorporate the PGA Tour, correct? Senator, we have not 
taken any funding. All we've done is settle the litigation and enter into a framework agreement in which the PGA Tour will be the clear leader of professional golf going forward. But there forward. is an understanding that PIF will contribute an investment As to a, the PGA Tour and the entity that will control it. They, they, they will not be contributing to the PGA Tour. It will be a PGA Tour control subsidiary and any funding what that is they, what is the amount of the Saudi investment that is going to be made that has not been determined yet Senator has Clear. there been any discussion of what that amount will be it would be uh, there's been discussions it would be a significant amount north of what one, are the north, amounts that have been discussed north of one billion and are, the, are there possibilities that additional amounts would be contributed that's in the complete control of the PGA Tour because it's a PGA Tour subsidiary and the board's controlled by the PGA Tour, and they have absolute control over how much funding they accept now and in the future. Instead of accepting this amount of money, call it an investment, call it financing, from the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, did you explore other sources of potential investment? We, we considered that, Senator, but had we gone down that path, we would still be fighting the, the very expensive and disruptive litigation. And we if you still, had won, you would have prevailed. Yeah, we did. We, that was far from a certainty, and Liv Goff would have continued to recruit our players and put our tour at jeopardy, and they could have become the leader of professional golf and operated it for the benefit of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. What other sources of funding did you explore? We, we did not have specific conversations with any uh, outside firm, but we, we, we talked about it as potential and what those terms might be. What conversations among yourselves did you have as to the alternative sources of funding? We, we, would, we talked about it at board meetings, a structure similar to what we've set up. Uh, we decided to not pursue it at any point in time because, of the re because we'd still be in litigation and still be fighting the public investment fund, which has 700 billion of assets. Uh, Mr. Price, in the talking points that you prepared for Jay Monahan to brief the policy board, Mr. Dunn was a member of it, uh, you indicate that, quote, PIF will make a financial investment to become a premier corporate sponsor of the PGA Tour and DP World Tour and other international tours PIF, is, PIF also is committed to significant financial support toward the PGA Tour directed causes that positively impact the game on a global basis. And by the way, one of the talking points is Greg Norman will be reassigned to an advisory role determined by PIF when the PGA Tour becomes the manager of the Live Tour. Mr. Dunn has said that the agreement doesn't talk about money, but there was an understanding about PIF investing in the new entity. It's called New Co. Uh, it may have another name now, and that investment you told us would be more than $1 billion, correct? There's, there's been no agreement reached, that, that, but there have been discussions of that nature. And I, I, would, I would just add that one of the things you mentioned, uh, if we reach an agreement that would be important to us, is the public investment fund providing uh, funding to, supply, to support social causes that would provide additional access to the game. Are you bound by the non-disparagement clause that is very specifically stated in the agreement? N not, not in this form, Senator. Not in this forum, but generally? Generally, in a, when you're negotiating a business agreement, it's common to have a non-disparagement clause so that you Well, it may be common, okay. Mr. Price, but you are bound by it. And Mr. Dunn, uh, as a member of the policy board and a party to these negotiations, you are bound by it as well, correct? Senator, I'm sitting before the United States senators. Y you can ask me what you want, and I will answer it truthfully. I'm not questioning that you will give us what you believe is the true as to, as to facts. But my understanding of this clause, and you're right, Mr. Price, it is very common to business agreements, is that it would be binding on you, on other members of the policy board, potentially on the athletes, indeed the live requirements 
for their players, have a similar bar to any of them saying anything negative about any relevant person, including members of the PIF governing apparatus. And so uh, I, uh, I'm i going to end my questioning now but uh, for this round, but um, I would like to have a commitment from both of you that uh, the final agreement will not prevent players or PGA Tour executives from commenting on or criticizing actions by, uh, of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Will you make that commitment? That will certainly be an objective we sh would seek, Senator, and I would add that the framework agreement does not prevent our players from speaking their mind on any matters. They're it, open. It doesn't now, but you can't commit that the final agreement will not require them to avoid any such disparaging statement? We, we do not anticipate it having that. You but, don't but anticipate it? Will negotiated. you commit that it won't have it, that you will not agree to it if it does? I wouldn't recommend it to the policy board for approval if Mr. it's Mr. Dunn? As, as I'm not doing the negotiation, but as Ron just said, he wouldn't recommend it. I will inform the entire board of your, of your excellent point. And it won't, you know, I, I'll guarantee you the board will vote on it. I don't have the power to decide that, but we hear you, we understand, and I'll advocate for it. If, if, we, get to, if we get to an agreement, and, and that, that disparagement, it, that is basically to the term of the agreement. So you, you generally don't want to be saying bad things about each other when you're negotiating, but it has a short-term life on it till we get to a definitive. I'll return to this line of questioning when I continue. Mr. Uh, ranking member is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to just try and lay out the reality that you were faced with. Um, first of all, you would have been seeking, you would not have been seeking large additional funding or large, large amounts of additional funding had it not been for the PIF entering the scene, correct? I mean, you're always seeking resources, that type of thing, but it's, it's only because of what the kingdom did, correct? That's correct, Senator Johnson. It's only because of Liv that we're sitting here today. And again, we're, we're, you're dealing with an entity that's 500 times larger than you in terms of financial wealth. Uh, Mr. Dunn, who is Roger Devlin? I've never met a Roger Devlin. Uh, he has emailed me. Uh, he is a member of a golf club over in England. He works, I believe, as a, an investment banking capacity and he had emailed me a couple times about uh, about uh, possible discussions about getting together. I, I believe he had helped Saudi Arabia invest in some soccer a soccer team or whatever. I so think I, I believe his partner is one of the co-investors with Yasser. So That's he, he had a relationship with the Saudis. He a did. Commercial one. He, he does, to my knowledge. He reached out to you in in January, saying, you know, the time may be ripe to sit down and and try and repair the breach. Uh, in and you rebuffed him at that point in time. You, you weren't ready for it. Is that a fair statement? If, if I may answer, Senator, my attitude was all of the people other than the guy with the money, we shouldn't talk to. We should just get to the spiritual leader. And because everything that was happening didn't make any sense to me. So I didn't want to waste any time talking to anybody. And my advice to the, to the commissioner was don't waste any time talking to anybody other than the guy with the money. And who's, who's that guy with the money in your mind? Uh, the governor, Yasser al-Rahman. OK. Uh, in, in, on April 14th, 2023, uh, Mr. Devlin emailed you. And the final line in his email states, <coughs> I fear the Saudis will double down on their investment and golf will be split asunder in perpetuity. Um, I mean, I read that and I, I recognize what reality the PGA was facing. I mean, is that kind of typify one of the reasons you decided to, to reach out to, uh, uh, to the Saudis? Uh, yeah, thank you, Senator. Uh, yeah, w w they didn't have to double down to, to create the problem that we already had. So if they just kept doing what they were doing, it would be significant enough because the PGA Tour is, is, it's really, it's not that big in terms of players. So if they take five players a year, in five years, 
Yeah. They can gut us. Again, the PGA was facing existential threat because of the PIF and because of LIV. So you're responding to that existential threat. So now you've agreed to reach out to uh, Yasser al Ramayan. Um, what did you make of the man? I mean, t tell us a little bit, of, you know, wh what was his motivation? I mean, I, I realize you can't necessarily get inside his head, but can you just kind of describe for us what, what, why were the Saudis doing this? Or why was uh, Yasser doing this? Uh, well, thank you, Senator. I, obviously, I'm, I'm not inside his, his head, but my perception, and as I said, I told the commissioner that the only, you should send someone only to speak to him. And, uh, in April, he, uh, he chose me to reach out to him. I went out to meet him. And unlike everyone else that is involved with LIV, where they're very acrimonious towards the PGA Tour, he, he said he respected the tour, respected how they did things. And I was surprised by that. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't have the attitude that, frankly, a lot of the management people had. And so I thought, it might make sense to put the man with the money and our commissioner together for another meeting. Des describe the challenge you have as the PGA, compensating the top players, compensating everybody, uh, and also attracting top players to come to your tournaments, which is what you need to attract the audience, the viewership, the TV deals, the, the sponsorship. Just talk about that challenge in general of managing just PGA Tour golf? Either one of you, whoever. Yeah, I think so, so we represent all the players. Uh, and, and so our you know, process we have to go through is allocating resources that the players earn through competition. We are performance-based, a pure meritocracy, as I think as you said, Senator Johnson. And so we try to balance the allocation of resources among our top players and the ones who are performing at a top level on a regular basis, while at the same time maintaining, maintaining earnings opportunities for all of our players. Uh, you know, the, the players who are performing well, our top players, those are the ones that the fans are interested in and fans tune in and watch, and they drive our revenues, primary revenue streams, media and sponsorship. And to the extent that Live Golf has been successful in taking away some of our top players uh, through their irrational, you know, economic business model, the that that puts pressure on our ability to maintain our primary revenue sources. And if they continue to do that, we would, as you said, would have faced an existential threat. Mr. Dunn, you've done a lot of deals, right? And you've been in a lot of negotiations. I, I, I've done a lot of negotiations myself. I've never had to do them in public. Um, I want to emphasize for the committee, for the audience, that you don't have a deal. You've, you've ended the litigation, which took a big liability off your plate. And I, I, I would certainly, you know, I've, I've been enough involved in enough uh, uh, litigation that you never know the result. I mean, it's always a big risk, right? Um, talk about how difficult it is for the PGA to have all this information exposed, you know, ideas get thrown out in negotiation. You know, they're rejected. But even the idea of being made public is not helpful. Describe how difficult it's going to be to conclude this deal. It makes it very, it, it makes it very complicated. I, I agree, you generally don't negotiate a deal uh, in public. But we're, com we're committed to try to move to, from a framework agreement to a definitive agreement because we believe that will allow us to continue our leadership in professional golf and our tournaments to be operated in accordance with our mission and our, and our standards for our players and for charity. We, we think that's very important, but, but these proceedings make that even more difficult. Now, Mr. Price, as we spoke over the phone a couple of weeks ago, and I read the framework, which immediately got leaked, um, it struck me as this is a kind of a win-win situation for the parties involved. They basically, it sounds like the Saudi got a seat at the table in terms of golf, but PGA retained its control over the game, over the competition. Um, you know, Mr. Dunn, can you just kind of speak to this? I mean, in any negotiation, what you want in the end is a win-win for everybody, and you can move forward successfully as opposed to acrimony and, you know, destructive behavior moving forward. Senator, that, that, that's the goal. Uh, 
I, I, I really understand Senator Blumenthal's concern about not having them take over. I, I, that's the last thing in the world we want. It's just, and I think through this agreement, we can, we can, we can get a win-win situation. My fear is if we don't get to an agreement, they're already putting billions of dollars into golf. They've got a management team that wants to destroy the tour. And even though, even though you could say take five or six players a year, they have an unlimited horizon and an unlimited amount of money. So it, it, it isn't like the product is better. It's just that there's a lot more money that will, that will, will make people move. And, and that's, I, I, I'm concerned with exactly what the Senator is worried about. I'm more concerned though, if we do nothing, we're gonna end up there. They're gonna end up owning, God, if we don't, if they can, they, they can do it. Because well, it sure. isn't that big. It's only a couple hundred players. I share that concern. And I'm and, deeply and, and concerned. I, and I sympathize with the position you're both in. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Johnson. Uh, Senator Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll try to be quick, uh, both out of respect for other members, but also have a presiding officership, uh, officership that begins in a few minutes. Um, but uh, I can't help but uh, uh, observe that there's a lot of conversation about what this means from the PGA leadership's perspective, what this could potentially mean from a PIF perspective in Saudi Arabia itself. I don't hear a lot of conversation about the players because the player's performance that drives the game. It's the player's performance that drives the fan base. It's the player's performance <coughs> that drives the revenues. So I wanna take a moment to focus on the players and the need to do right by them should this agreement actually be concluded. As we all know, prior to the framework that was announced, the PGA Tours uh, officials were highly critical of LIV. And those who chose to join LIV. In fact, I understand that the PGA Tour suspended at least 24 players who participated in LIV events and declared them ineligible to participate in PGA Tour tournaments. Of course, PGA officials then turned around and did exactly the same thing they criticized some players for leaving those players who chose to remain loyal to the PGA and forego the significant financial benefits of joining LIV, understandably wondering what was the point of remaining loyal to the PGA. So Mr. Dunn, can you tell me how will players who remained loyal to the PGA be made whole? Uh, will they be eligible for some form of damages? And it's not just the foregone income that was a real pain, but their reputations even uh, taken a hit. Can you explain to me how players are gonna be uh, uh, made good should this agreement go through? Uh, it's really, but, but I, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll answer, but Ron is really doing the negotiation, but uh, thank you for your question, Senator. Nothing will happen without the players' fully support. Uh, we have five player representatives on the Tour Policy Board. I, I can't imagine the circumstance where I won't be voting with the majority of them. So, uh, and I have to emphasize, we negotiated the settlement of the lawsuit in complete secrecy because of the fear that a lot of people make a lot of money in these lawsuits, especially the other side's lawyers. So to the degree that got out, we, we would never have gotten that to fruition. All that we have done, and it's a two-stage negotiation, a little bit of what Senator Johnson was talking about. First, the first part is lawsuit settles, tour has to be in charge, and we agree to talk. Now we're talking with complete transparency. So the players, are gonna have to get something that they appreciate for staying on the tour. I hear you. Time is limited as you turn over to Mr. Price for your remarks. Let me also add in the dimension of, for the new players that were now eligible to compete in the PGA because there was a handful that left to live, what happens to them after uh, this merger if it goes through? <laughs> Senator, we, we've, got, we, we've got two task forces in place now, and we're working with our player directors because we're a membership organization. 
that's who we represent. And the first task force is evaluating ways in which we can recognize the players who remain loyal to the PGA Tour. That's very important to us. We will not move forward with a definitive agreement unless we get that right and our players support that. For players who left the tour to play for Live, they were suspended. They come back, they're not gonna be playing for Live. They'll be playing for a PGA Tour controlled uh, sports league or, or golf league. And they will have to go through our existing rules and regulations process to gain re-entry to, right. to well, the just, PGA just membership. Just that's one of the, of the areas tour. that we'll be watching. Yeah. Uh, the second, Mr. Chair, instead of uh, asking an additional question, I'll just uh, state a concern for the record and we'll follow up in uh, you know, f future uh, conversations here. But during the 2023 season, Live Golf pulled a bait and switch from what I understand, on the, its television broadcast technicians who are represented by the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees when they switch to a non-union production company and making the technicians behind Live Golf's production some of the few in major sports who do not receive any health and retirement benefits while providing coverage. So while I, my first question was about the players specifically, please know I'm interested in the uh, uh, treatment and fairness of all employees that make golf revenues, including but not limited to significant broadcast revenues possible, not just as players, but uh, in, in the broadcast, the production, uh, et cetera. So yet another area that we'll be following up on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Padilla. Uh, Senator Paul. I've been a vocal critic of the Saudis for years and led the effort to block billions in arms sales to Saudi Arabia. The Saudis have demonstrated a relentless pattern of malign behavior ranging from the brutal killing and dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi with their, within their consulate, for which they evaded punishment and their consistent disregard for human rights is well known. Additionally, they have committed war crimes in Yemen, a war for which American taxpayers are being used as unwitting accomplices resulting in thousands of civilian casualties from their ruthless actions. Nevertheless, I see no constitutional power that suggests Congress should insolve, involve itself in golf. I have no doubt that some will argue that the tax code or somewhere in the ever-expansive commerce clause is the power to regulate private agreements. I disagree. As an originalist, an originalist interpretation of the Constitution would lead to a different conclusion. If we took the Ninth Amendment seriously, if we took the principles of liberty, of contract seriously, we would acknowledge that the Constitution affords protection for such agreements. We have no business asking the PGA about their negotiations or what they might do or what they might do. It's not the business of government. If members of the Senate wanted to express their outrage over Saudi Arabia in a meaningful way, I gave them an opportunity to do so. In December 2021, I proposed canceling $650 million sale of 280 advanced air-to-air -air missiles and 596 missile launchers to Saudi Arabia, but there was no congressional hearing. We're here today talking about golf, but we didn't have one congressional hearing over sending hundreds of millions of dollars of advanced weapons to Saudi Arabia. There was no expression of outrage. Instead, 67 senators voted against my proposal and voted to continue selling arms to Saudi Arabia. It's time that Congress rediscovers the presumption of liberty, that our first recourse is to defend the unenumerated rights of private actors, not to expand our few and defined powers to regulate anything we may personally dislike. As a member of this institution, I find no grounds for government to be involved in the game of golf. But are there legitimate questions? Could we have legitimate hearings? Are there things we should be discussing? Of course. Do the 9-11 victims have a legal obligation owed to them by the Saudi Arabian government? It's a real question. Should we be involved with selling arms to Saudi Arabia? A real question. Should be debated, and we should have votes on these things. Should we be involved in the war in Yemen? Nobody in Congress ever voted to go in war in Yemen. Why the hell are we involved in that war? Furthermore, with regard to sports, there is a valid discussion that should be going on, we should have a discussion of, and that's the antitrust involvement in, in sports. I think like most antitrust, it's topsy-turvy. It's flipped upside down. It's doing the wrong thing. 
PGA mentioned they have some rules. You join the PGA, you gotta obey some rules to be part of the PGA. If you don't obey those rules, they should have the right to exclude you. That's what associations are about. If you don't allow them to have rules, the court has totally screwed this up and Congress has let them. The court ruled unanimously that the NCAA can't invoke their rules. And so they've completely screwed up college athletes. We used to be proud, many of us love watching amateur athletes that weren't paid. Now everybody that plays basketball in, in college is gonna be driving a Bentley or a Rolls. I mean, we're gonna be seeing rap stars instead of basketball stars. I mean, this is crazy. But you know why it happened? Because Congress sat around and said, oh, well, because of antitrust, we can't let the NCAA do it. It went to the court and the court made the ruling, unfortunately, a unanimous ruling based on the law. So the law's gotta change. Antitrust shouldn't be involved with associations, shouldn't be involved with the PGA, shouldn't be involved with the NCAA. For the most part, antitrust in our country actually does the opposite of what it is intended to do. I'll give you another example. As a physician, if five physicians get together and say, we don't like Blue Cross paying us $80 and we want to get $100 an exam from, from Blue Cross or from United or, or from Humana, from some billion dollar company, do you know what antitrust does? Antitrust sues five doctors and says you can't talk about this. It's ridiculous. Antitrust is actually protecting the big people versus the small people. But it's a unique situation to talk about associations, particularly sports associations. Antitrust should let sports associations. You don't have to join PGA. You don't have to join the sports association. You can be outside the NCAA, but the only way they had power was because they had the power of a large body and there was prestige in being part of the NCAA. All of that's gone. It's the wild, wild west, and nobody knows what's going to happen with college sports, but nobody's really happy about it. You know, there always are professional sports, and as someone who grew up in a sport that wasn't one where you were well remunerated, I understand the idea of trying to allow some contracts. There were some in-betweens on these things. You know, for swimmers, swimmers don't really have professional sports. But at the same time, there was a way to probably do this that could have been done through the NCAA, but the courts gutted the NCAA, and Congress sat by and watched this. So there are legitimate concerns that we could look into as Congress, but I don't think it's a legitimate concern to berate private individuals over contracts, to get involved and say, well, what are you going to do? Will you promise me the contract won't do this? That's not the role of government to tell people, oh, you can't make a contract doing this. No, in a free country, you make contracts. They're the business of the people making contracts, and government shouldn't be involved in this at all. So I see a certain illegitimacy to the whole proceeding today. Valid questions about Saudi Arabia that should be addressed but we're not addressing the valid things because we have a show trial basically of a private organization, which I think is inappropriate. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Paul. I'm gonna take the prerogative of the chair to uh, address at least the legal issue that you've raised, the constitutional question. Uh, Congress's authority to investigate here and investigate golf comes from Article One, Section <clears throat> 8 of the Constitution, which gives us the power to lay and collect taxes and to regulate and therefore investigate interstate commerce. Uh, I don't need to tell anyone in this room, golf is a $100 billion industry. Mr. Dunn himself has referred to the billions of dollars, 3.6 billion, I believe, that the PGA Tour has provided to charity. Uh, in my own state, the Travelers Championship brings $60 million to my state annually and millions of dollars to local charities. The PGA Tour has a major impact on our economy, our way of life, our image in this country, our self-image and our image abroad. Uh, the PGA, PGA Tour also derives tremendous benefits from tax laws established by Congress because it operates as a 501c6 not-for-profit entity and that provision of law has received little scrutiny. This inquiry may lead to close scrutiny of 501c6. A study conducted in 2013 found that this benefit was worth at least $200 million to the tour between 1993 and 2013. Congress has a long history of conducting oversight on matters related to sports. I've participated in a number of them involving the NCAA, domestic violence in the NFL, doping in Major League Baseball, 
sexual assault in women's gymnastics, and anti-competitive practices in multiple sports. But most importantly, as I said in my opening remarks, this hearing and our investigation is ultimately not about golf. We're here because we're concerned about the PGA Tour's deal in terms of what it means for an authoritarian government to use its wealth to capture American institutions, to capture American institutions, because we are an open society. And I've joined Senator Paul in many of his amendments, advocacy, and so forth involving the Saudi government, and I appreciate much of what he has said about it, uh, but I do think that there is not only a legitimate role here, an imperative role for this committee in the United States Congress. Senator Scott. Point of inquiry. Point of inquiry. Yes, yes sir. Um, nothing in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution allows Congress to intervene or involve itself in private contractual negotiations. Well, if that's an inquiry, the answer is nothing explicitly authorizes intervention. But as you well know, antitrust law, consumer protection law, many other laws involve protection of public interests and individual interests because the public interest demands it. Senator Scott. Sure. Um, I didn't get, I didn't uh, get to participate in the, in the hall here, and I have to go to another hearing. But first off, thank you for, uh, for being here. You're a great Florida company. Uh, as you know, golf is a really important to our economy. Um, I can't imagine doing what you're doing, trying to negotiate a deal when you have uh, cameras in front of you. Uh, my prior life was negotiating deals and doing deals, and, and you'll never get it. It's very difficult to get a deal done that way. So uh, I think that's pretty frustrating for you guys. But could you talk about just take a state like Florida or any other, you can pick any other state, the importance of what golf is doing uh, from a charity standpoint, from a global, building a global brand standpoint, and how important uh, what golf is, has become to this country? Senator Scott, I'll be happy to, to speak to that, and I'm happy to tell you that in addition to the PGA Tour being headquartered in Florida and our flagship tournament players club, TPC Sawgrass, being there, we conduct 10 tournaments in your state. Those tournaments generate over $30 million for charity annually. Cumulatively, our tournaments in the state of Florida have generated over $800 million for charity, and our annual economic impact in Florida is over $800 million. And importantly, those are the type of things that we're trying to protect, our ability to do that. If we can move from the framework agreement to the definitive agreement in which the PGA Tour has absolute control, we'll be able to continue to do that, and we'll be able to expand our economic impact in Florida and across the nation. We're in 34 states now. We have an economic impact of over $4 billion. We think we can grow that significantly if we can reach the definitive agreement. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Senator Scott, and, uh, you know, I think golf is a force of good. I think if people get to know each other and play golf, I think it will solve a lot of problems. And I think uh, to the degree that golf is a global game, uh, it's incumbent of all of us to try to reach out and try to avoid things, and maybe there's a possibility of meeting people from with different faiths, different religions, different colors, that we can, we can get to know better and, and maybe they can, we can have a better world. That's how I look at it. All right. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Good luck. Senator Marshall. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and welcome to, to our guests. When I think about life at, at this level, typically motivations are sex, money, or power. And as we look at this merger, I'm trying to figure out why. You know, it, where's the money, where's, where's the power? So I'll start with you, Mr. Price. Who is losing out on money and who's losing out on power in this deal? Thank you, Senator. And so if, you know, we, we had two options. One was being uh, in a situation of where we faced the threat of professional golf being taken over by Live Golf, which is 100% funded by the Public Investment Fund. That, right? The second option is for the PGA Tour 
to continue to lead professional golf. Operated in accordance with our... So I'm specifically who? Who is going to be making less money and who's going to have less power because of this merger? Someone is, is losing out. I would assume that's why we're here today. Senator, I would describe it as a situation of where the PGA Tour stays in the same position that it's in. Our players and our charities win. I don't know that anyone is losing. I think it benefits all of our There's no individuals that will be losing be because of this financially. No, no, sir, because we're healing a fracture, a fracture in professional golf. Okay. Mr. That, Dunn, the same question for you, I, I guess, is what, who is, who's losing out? Who's the loser in this? Who's losing money? Who's losing power? It's a very good question, Senator. Uh, the tour golf is the winner because we continue to uphold the standards and traditions of the meritocracy. Golf, professional golf is hard. You have to really work hard. It, it's, it's, and it's fragile. You have a window. So in your opinion, there's no, no in, in, private investors. I don't understand the, the complexity of, of your, of your uh, nonprofit organization, but there's no individuals that will be losing money because of this, you don't think? No, no individuals losing any power. The lawyers will, will lose money. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because that's because that's, the that's the 100 million a year. I mean, between everybody. Okay. Uh, who, who has the most to gain from a power and a financial? I'll just stick with you, Mr. Who's gaining from this financially and with power? I'm sorry, you're asking me? Yes. I think the PGA Tour definitely stays intact and becomes more powerful. And I think, I hope that in a more constructive way, uh, Yasser gets a more productive role in the game of golf. Because I think the PGO, PGA Tour product is vastly superior. That's my opinion. Thank you. Mr. Price, who do you think gains the most from this financially and control? It, Thank you, Senator. I, I firmly believe it's it's the PGA Tour's constituents, our players, our fans, our sponsors, and charity, all clearly win under the under the framework agreement if we can reach a definitive agreement. Okay, I'm sure this question has been asked earlier. I've been in another committee, but as I review this, um, the document provided us a lot of this was done in the in the dark of, of the night, so so to speak. And I think some of you, even your own members were surprised when they saw this deal. Uh, put, put together. So, Mr. Dunn, what was your reaction? Were you on the inside of when all this was happening? I don't, I don't recall. Yes, Senator. I, w I was. I had originally reached out. Okay. So you were I, from the beginning. How did some of your friends and, and long-term members react to this? To you personally? Well, a twofold. They they were stunned, and the rollout was very misleading and inaccurate, which is everyone's fault. Uh, there is no merger. There is no deal. There is simply an agreement to try to get to an agreement and settle the lawsuits. So you had an initial surge of anxiety due to the ineffective and ina inaccurate rollout. And now it's settling in to well, there's nothing there yet. And we're having the reality of having to try to figure out something which is done in unbelievable transparency. You know, there, there's an issue about sometimes too many cooks in the kitchen. Well, in this case, everyone in the world is in the kitchen. So it's, it's going to be difficult, but we're going to work hard at it. Thank, thank you for that answer. You know, today we're here on the Subcommittee on Investigation of the United States Senate Committee on Homeland Security and trying to figure out why this issue was raised to this level. I, I got to tell you, no one back home has asked me, hey, what do you, what's the Senate think about this, this merger? It, At the same time, every day somebody asks me, why were we funding viral gain of function research in Wuhan, China? They ask me, why is the CDC now pushing a, a medication that's not safe to be uh, used to help uh, biological men make a milk-like substance? the CDC in direct contra, uh, contradiction to the FDA. 
And they asked me about uh, the president's son, and they were concerned that he's running a criminal enterprise out of the White House. And now uh, more questions than answers on the cocaine found in the White House. Those are the questions that people ask me about. Why aren't we investigating them? I don't see like, have any of this is prudent to the daily lives of American working families who are paying twice as much for groceries and gasoline than they were two years ago. Many of you said that the LIV organization is the Saudis' way of sports washing, and I want to dig a little bit deeper into that. What was China doing when they hosted the Olympics but a few years ago, but sports washing, trying to wash their enslavement of hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of Muslims, trying to sports wash their purchase of thousands of United States farmland acres, to sports wash their research into bioterrorism weapons. Why aren't we investigating those issues? Why aren't we investigating that 90% of the counterfeits that come into this country are made in China? 90% of the fentanyl that comes into this country is, is made in, in China. They steal $500 billion of intellectual property from us every year. Those are the things that we should be investigating. Those are the things that Kansans want to know. I look forward to the day when we have honest discussions in this committee and our investigation powers to investigate our own out-of-control federal bureaucracy that actually impacts the American people. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman, but I do want to wish the very best of success to Topeka, Kansas' own PGA great, Gary Woodland. We're very proud of him. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Marshall. Senator Hawley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. I think I heard you testify <clears throat> to the chairman just a little bit ago that you may take a billion dollars or more from the Saudis. Let's take a, talk about some of the money that you've taken from communist China. Speaking of sports washing, what can you tell me, Mr. Price, about the PGA Tour China series? The PGA, thank you, Senator. Uh, the PGA Tour China series uh, was last operated in 2019. We have it not operated it since then and have no plans to continue that series. You don't have a you don't have a PGA tour in China at all right now? We do not. What about the the PGA China tour? Let's look at uh, the quote here from Mr. Greg Gillingan. PGA Tour China is truly thrilled to be partnering with Shanghai Sports on the PGA Tour Series China. Shanghai is a world-class organization with great experience of connecting the expectations of international sports bodies with an understanding of the Chinese market. This, this isn't happening? I'm not sure, uh, Senator, what the date on that quote is, but we have not conducted the, uh, the PGA Tour China Series since 2019. But and you just signed a 20-year agreement to conduct a, a, a tour series in China, correct? It has, it has not been... It has not been conducted since 2019. Did you take $45 million in financing from the Yao Group to conduct PGA Tour China? No, sir, we did not. PGA, your spokesperson said, this is Laura Livesey, PGA Tour China is owned and operated by the PGA Tour and supported by the General Administration of Sports of China and the China Golf Association. So you're saying this, is, this doesn't exist anymore. When was it shut down? It has it, it has it operated since 2019. Did you return the money? So we were we were we were not paid forty five million dollars. I don't recall the specific details of the agreement. Uh, we received a sanction and fee, as I recall, for the for the series of events, and it, there was an operator within China that actually operated the events. So, you, so you're saying you don't know anything about this? No. I, no, sir, I didn't say that. I just said it hasn't been operated since 2019, and I, I don't recall the specifics of the agreement, but I can certainly get those to you. Well, you I know the it. specifics of the agreement. The Chinese private equity firm Yao Capital financed the PGA Tour Shanghai deal with $45 million investment. The Yao Capital firm has direct ties to the Chinese Communist Party. Does that concern you? Concerns me. And, and Senator, we, we are, we're not operating there anymore, and I believe I can get the details, but that money went directly to an operator in China, not the PGA Tour. It was a deal between the PGA Tour and a Chinese company to do a series of events. You at least admit those events happened just a few years ago, right? They, they did happen for a series okay. of years. Okay, so you're telling me that you're not going to do any further business in China, you've got no contracts with any Chinese entities, and you're not going to operate PGA events in China? We, we have no plans to, consider, to continue that series at this point in time. We're and not, you're not going to operate any other series? We're, we're, you're not going to do anything in China? Is that, do I understand you correctly? We, ha we have no present plans to do that. Has the PGA, given your past business relationships with 
Chinese entities? Have, have you taken a stand, a stance on the Uyghur concentration camps? Have you condemned the genocide there? We do, Senator, we do, uh, we firmly support human rights uh, and uh, we're very concerned about what's happened there, but we, we leave those type matters to our, to our U.S. government, but we certainly do not condone that type of activity. Well, wait a minute. When you say you leave the matters to the United States government, I, I'm just asking you, do you, do you, will you speak out against the persecution and internment of Uyghurs in China? You've done business in China. You've conducted tour events in China. You've accepted money from Chinese entities in, in some form of a partnership. Do you condemn the concentration camps that currently, as we sit here and speak, are imprisoning Uyghurs, religious minorities, in that nation? Senator, we certainly do not condone or support that top activity. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about your lobbying activity as it relates to the Saudi deal. Public reports say that you paid lobbyists last year in one quarter, just one quarter of the year, six figures or more as to lobby Congress on the Saudi Golf League proposals. What was that related to? Senator, we, we went to uh, members of Congress as we, as we faced a very threat to our existence to make them aware of what the public investment fund was attempting to do through its operations of the Live Golf Series. And so make, it, I mean, make Congress aware and, and ask for what? What did you want this body to do? Senator, anything that the Congress could do within its power to help preserve an American institution. But this is before you agreed to take a billion dollars from the same people that you were lobbying against a year ago. Senator, we, we faced a choice. One was to allow professional golf to be taken over and operated by the public investment fund of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The second was to allow the PGA Tour to continue to lead it in accordance with our mission and our values for the benefit of our players and charity. Let me come back to, if I could, this issue with the PGA Tour of China series. Why didn't you disclose your activities and your partnership with Yao Capital and the Shanghai Group? Why didn't you disclose that on your Form 990? You're a tax-exempt organization, is that right? I think you testified to that effect. 501c6 tax-exempt organization. Okay, so you have yes, to file sir. a Form 990, is that correct? Yes, sir. The Form 990 contains a Schedule F, is that correct? Yes. The Schedule F requires you to disclose any activities conducted overseas, including unrelated trade or business programs, uh, services, fundraising activities, investments, or maintaining offices, employees, or agents for the purpose of conducting any such activities. Your Form 990s didn't disclose anything related to your dealings in China. Why not? Senators. Our intention is to fully comply with all the disclosure requirements on Form 990. If there is a disclosure requirement that, that we should have made that we didn't, we'll, we will get that corrected. Were you attempting to paper over what you had done in China and your, your partnership with these Chinese entities? Absolutely not, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Hawley. Uh, we're going to begin a second round of questions if any of our colleagues arrive in the meantime. We're also, I think, scheduled to have a vote at 1130. So at some point we may have to take a brief recess. Uh, I, I wanna come back to the disparagement issue and the non-disparagement agreement. Um, and just so everybody understands, I, I, I get it that you don't feel you have a deal, but the litigation is gone, right? Yes, sir. It's history. Yes, so sir. So whatever threat yeah. Live Golf represents to you, it's no longer the cost of litigation. Tomorrow, you could go through an IPO, you could go to private equity funders, you could go to the players if they wanted to own, as well as be members of the PGA Tour. You have a lot of options right now, correct? Senator, if we chose one of those options, we would still be facing a real threat that Lil Golf and the $700 billion public investment fund would continue to recruit our top players. But Mr. Price, players have stood by you. Mr. Dunn himself, and I wanna hold up this quote, 
which I think is so powerful, talking about Tiger Woods and the offer of $700 million? It takes a lot to say no to a bucket full of money. These players who stood by you are heroes. They deserve our thanks. And I am betting, because I never want to bet against America, that America will be on your side, thick or thin. Do you agree, Mr. Dunn? Uh, Senator, I, uh, it, it's an excellent, excellent uh, line of uh, questioning, and thank you for raising it. Uh, we're contractually obligated to try to uh, see if we can come to a deal that makes sense. We'll, we'll meet all our obligations. Uh, as, as Senator Johnson and, uh, and Senator Marshall have pointed out, that when, when, when it's in this massive transparency, it will make things difficult. Uh, if it ends up we don't get to an agreement, which is possible, Live Golf will still be there. They'll still have a, a lot of money, and we'll be we're gonna, we'll have to do all the things you're talking about. So you still have the choice to stand up against sports washing, against the Saudi monarchy, against the hundreds of billions of dollars, and maybe a lot more that the Saudis will throw at you, and stand up for America, because America is going to stand up for you, and maybe you're contractually bound to give it your best efforts to reach an agreement. Yeah. But there is something that stinks about this path that you're on right now, because it is a surrender. And it is all about the money. And that's the reason for the backlash that you've seen, Mr. Price. The equity ownership interest that the Saudis will have, and that's a term from this agreement, gives them financial dominance. They control the purse strings. And you may say that your objective is to prevent a non-disparagement clause. But as I read the disparagement clause, non-disparagement clause in this agreement, each party agrees in covenants that it will not at any time, directly or indirectly, make, publish, or communicate to any person or entity or in any public forum, any defamatory or disparaging remarks, comments, or statements concerning the other party, their affiliates, and ultimately, and ultimate beneficial owners or the respective businesses, directors, employees, officers, shareholders, members, or advisors. That's about as broad a non-disparagement clause as I've ever seen. And I've been a law enforcer for most of my career as the US attorney in Connecticut as attorney general of my state for 20 years as a private litigator. You know, in 2019, general manager Daryl Morley of the Houston Rockets tweeted support for Hong Kong. The NBA stood by him, even though China imposed significant economic costs on the NBA in an attempt to get the league to suppress his speech. Will you commit today, Mr. Price, that the PGA Tour will not punish any members who criticize the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia or human rights anywhere, regardless of this new relationship with PIF? Can you commit to the final agreement and that the PGA Tour will not punish anyone for criticism of anybody in Saudi Arabia? Thank you, Senator. I can tell you that the framework agreement, under the framework agreement, our players are absolutely free to speak their mind without any assault calls for Well, you might want to check with Tour. Governor Al-Ramayan because you are a membership organization. Your commitment is on behalf of that organization. The athletes are members of it. You don't have to be a legal scholar to know that there is potential liability here. Senator, our, our position is that the players are free to speak their mind under that agreement, and that's the way we would interpret it. Will you commit to protect player expression? Go to court if necessary. Relitigate, sue PIF or anyone who tries to inhibit their speech. 
Senator, we're a membership organization and we always take our player interest uh, very uh, importantly and, and we would try to protect their interest. Well, you know, the answer to that question should be yes. We'll do it proudly. We'll protect our players. We will protect our players proudly. And it, you asked me about the definitive agreement. I, we wouldn't recommend any defini definitive agreement to the board for approval that had such a clause in it. Well, that is less than what I would like to see as a commitment here. Let me turn to um, some of the other questions that were raised. By the way, the, the agreement that has been put in the public realm is the result of your disclosing it, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so it's not like we ferreted it out or infringed on the privacy of your negotiations. You disclosed it voluntarily. It was, it was disclosed to this committee and then we disclosed it. Well, Senator, if I could just add one other sure. thing with regard to, because I think you know, there, there may not be a clear understanding with regard to control. We will not move, we, we do not have an agreement now. We only have a framework agreement. We will not move to a definitive agreement unless the PGA Tour is in complete control of the new entity, which will be a PGA Tour subsidiary controlled by the PGA Tour board and operated for the benefit of all of our constituents, our players, our fans, our sponsors, and our charity. If that's not, if that's not where we end up, we will not even recommend approval, much less the board would not approve that. I'm not here to to argue with you or parse the terms of the agreement, Mr. Price, but the simple fact is that the Saudi government's the dominant owner here. It has the equity interest. It controls the purse strings. It has the money, and the money is the reason you surrendered in this agreement. And the money will be there going forward. A billion dollars is just the beginning. So I think the American people can see through some of what you may be sta stating with the best of intentions. Uh, let me follow up on uh, a question that Mr. Hawley raised. Will you commit that you will have no PGA Tour events in China going forward? Senator, I, you know, I'm not in a position to commit the tour indefinitely, but we do not have anything planned for the, for the foreseeable future. That'll depend on what the new entity, the new co, decides. The PGA Tour will have full control over that entity, and it will determine its schedule and where our tournaments are located, or otherwise we will not approve, uh, recommend approval of the definitive agreement. Will you commit to have no PGA Tour events in Russia? Senator, I, I can't commit the PGA Tour for the long term, but we certainly do not have any plans to conduct any events in Russia. What are the current assets of the PGA Tour? Our, our total assets are approximately $3 billion. And net well, assets, as the Senator Johnson referenced earlier, $1.3 billion. I'm sorry, which, which net, figure net, is correct? Net, 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 the gross assets, approximately $3 billion. Net assets, Senator Johnson referenced earlier, are, are approximately $1.3 billion. Um, I have a breakdown for 2021 of the PGA's revenue. Maybe we can put that chart up. Uh, the PGA Tour brought in over $1.5 billion in revenue in 2021. Less than 3% of it, uh, $43,694,020 was expensed as charitable grants. I don't mean to minimize that amount. It's a lot of money. But my question is, where did the rest of it go? The rest, the rest of our revenue would have been in the cost to produce the revenue, and our, our largest cost is what we pay our players who compete for prize money through, through, our, through our tournaments. How much of that money went to players? And I'd have to check in 2021. I can tell you in 2023, we will distribute almost $1 billion to our players. Out of how much revenue? 
our, our gross revenues in 2023 are approximately $2.1 billion. And would it be fair to say that the remainder of that amount goes to produce the tournaments? It's, it's the cost of producing the tournaments. It's the cost of generating the revenues. There is charity distributed also. And if I, if I could add, Senator, just for clarification, we are a 501c6 membership or trade association. Our mission is to generate uh, economic opportunities for our players. But we have voluntarily structured our tournaments in a way so that the net proceeds of our tournaments go to charity. So in addition to what you had on that chart, there are tournaments who are given their net proceeds to tur tournaments because we partner with 501c3 organizations. That's how we generated over $215 million for charity last year and over $3.6 billion cumulatively. And you own a number of the tournaments, like the Travelers in Connecticut you own, correct? No, sir. We partner with a 501c3 organization who conducts that tournament. You partner with them, but who owns the tournament? We, we, can, we conduct the competition, but the local charity organization that we work with in Hartford sells the tickets, the hospitality, and sponsorship. Uh, and the net proceeds they generate, which are, which are annually, I think, in the uh, approximately $2 million, goes back to charity in the local Hartford community. If this litigation is ended and your revenue is almost three billion a year. Why do you need the Saudis billion dollars? We we did not seek the Saudis. We we were in a situation of where we faced a real threat of But you could go elsewhere for a billion dollars, three billion dollars, maybe fifty billion dollars, correct? We could, uh, but if we went down that path, we would end up giving up total control of the PGA Tour. In this particular situation, not only did we preserve the Tour's future leadership of but professional you could, golf. But you could insist on the same requirements for independence of the Tour that you are insisting on, you say, from the Saudis. We could potentially try that approach, and but we would still face the threat of a $700 billion fund recruiting our players and operating a league in an irrational economic manner. Well, again, I can only emphasize to you, Mr. Price, that your players, like Tiger Woods, gave up hundreds of millions of dollars. They stood strong. I hope the PGA Tour will as well. We may have, I may have more questions, but uh, if uh, I could, with Senator, apologies to my colleagues, I'm gonna turn to sure. Senator Johnson for his second well, round. Well, let me first state, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just don't think it's appropriate to be asking you know, these representatives of the PGA to make assurances in terms of what they will and will not do. Obviously, they have to assure us that they'll follow the law, but exactly you know, how they operate, you know, they're, they're a private organization. You know, they, they have to deal with a, a complex set of issues in terms of running a league for the benefit of their players and I would say for fans. Um, I think things have gotten muddled here. First of all, the PGA never would have sought yeah, correct. additional funding. You didn't need it. The, the, the only reason you're looking for funding from the PIF is an accommodation for PIF to have a seat at the table in running golf. If you don't offer them that seat, they'll take their $700 billion, a portion of that, and they will just keeping off, they will keep picking off players one by one until they destroy the game of golf at the highest competitive level. I mean, Mr. Dunn, isn't that how you see it? Uh, thank you, Senator. Yeah, it's, it's very important that we, we didn't decide one day we'll go over to Riyadh and and bring these guys in here. Uh, no, you were highly reluctant to well, reach out we, to them. We, we got to the table because of the existence of LIV. They own 100% of LIV. They have billions of dollars in LIV. 
they have no economic constraint, they have no time constraint. So when you deal with a normal investor, they, they want to return quickly. They have a long horizon. I don't, I don't exactly know all their thought process, but they, they view it differently. We're, we're, they sued us. We, we did not decide to sue them. They took our players. Their entire existence is based on taking more of our players. Uh, that's just a reality. We're not complaining about it. That's just, that's what it is. Well, first of all, you, you'd be justified in complaining about it, okay? I mean, you faced an existential threat. You faced this for two years. Uh, you engaged in litigation, spend what, about $50 million just trying to defend yourself, and all of a sudden there was a way out of this. Potentially. You know, there was a truce. Because of some favorable court uh, hearings or rulings, but there was no guarantee that you were going to continue to win court rulings. You could have lost. Okay, and, you know, I'll, I'll answer Senator Marshall's question from, from is what I know. It seems like you've achieved in a really bad situation between a rock and a hard place. You actually carved out a win-win situation. Again, that's, that's not to speak to the sport washing aspect of this and the concerns. And, again, Mr. Dunn, if, if anybody has a concern of you know, what happened on 9-11, it's you. You lost, again, 40% of your colleagues, uh, your mentor in this. So we need to recognize the reality you face that you still face. There's no, guarantee, there's no deal. There's no guarantee you're going to have a deal. If you don't get a deal, Problem. you'll have the Saudis willing to spend billions and billions, and at some point in time, players that were loyal to the PGA Tour will say, this isn't going away. I'm a chump for not expecting or for not accepting 10 million, 50 million, 100 million dollars to go over to this league and we'll just you know leave the PGA Tour behind and now rather than playing for the purity of the competition for the title, oh, it's just about money. It's like I'm, I make 10 million bucks whether I sh whether I win or not just by showing up. That destroys the game of golf. I mean, that's my perspective of this. I mean, can you tell me where I'm wrong or where I'm right? You know, Senator, golf is a little different. You know, you gotta you gotta show up and dig it out of the ground. And uh, Senator Blumenthal, I, I guess that quote I said it takes a lot to turn down a lot of money. I think it was, uh, if I recall, I think it was in reference to Tiger Woods. And uh, he's the example of that. He digs it out of the ground. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to say no to all that. And we have a lot of unbelievably gutty guys that love the game that have said no. And we want to support them every way we can, one way or another. And we'll be there and we'll do that. Uh, by, by the way, it. it sounds like the PIF, you know, reading the documents behind this, that, that they were recognizing the players that stayed true to the PGA Tour, and they are going to figure out some way to compensate that. I mean, I, I saw that in the documents. They, they were obviously aware of that, correct? So, again, yes. I'm running out of time, but, but I want to underscore, you know, my concern about holding this hearing, and I could say a whole lot more, but I don't want to queer the deal. This is a delicate, delicate negotiation. There's nothing certain about this. Again, from, from what I see, out of an awful situation, you know, Mr. Dunn, by you reaching out and, you know, the other people negotiating this are getting about as good a deal as we can expect that is about as win-win situation. Recognizing what uh, Mr. Al Rumayan was looking for, a seat at the table, um, some saying how golf operates, but no control. You, you retain that control. So, you know, my suggestion... And again, I, I, don't, I don't say that Congress doesn't have a role to play. We talked about that in terms of antitrust. And maybe once there's a deal to come back and take a look at this. But I mean, for the time being, Mr. Chairman, I would recommend we give these guys the space to negotiate something. Yeah, I, I think you know, their motivations are pure. They're trying to preserve this game. They're, they're trying to do right by their players. They're trying to do right by this country. Um, give, give, them, give them the space to negotiate a deal and then if we have a problem with it, we can come back and look at it later. But, 
You know, Mr. Price, Mr. Dunn, do you have any comments on that? I, I, I agree with what you said, Senator Johnson. We're, we're trying to negotiate a deal that preserves our leadership role in professional golf so that we can fulfill our mission for our players and charity. Uh, and if, if we cannot do that as we negotiate the deal, we won't recommend a definitive agreement for approval. And again, if you don't get a deal, the Saudis will just keep pouring billions into this over time. Those players have showed the loyalty to the PGA Tour will at some point in time say, I got to provide for family. You know, Mr. Dunn, you talked to me in my office. You know, golf, you're, you're two bad swings away from losing the confidence to be able to compete at that high level. Pretty tenuous. All of a sudden, a, a deal with the, with the live could be pretty attractive. Senator, you know, there's no denying that. And some players that have went have expressed that, that, that that's a reality. It's hard. Professional golf's very hard. And uh, if we're <laughs> able to get to an agreement, a definitive, which, and, and candidly, I appreciate Senator Blumenthal's concerns. I, we're all concerned we all about do. the same thing. And, 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 and with that good guidance, it'll help us in the negotiation know, know what's important or not. But if we do get to an agreement, the players that stayed are going to, we, we, we want to do everything we can for them, and we want to do everything we can for the game, and we want to do everything for the sponsors and the charities, and that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're really trying to do. Well, again, I appreciate your challenge. I appreciate, you know, what you're up against, and I just wish you the best of luck. Thank you. So Thank you. You'd be successful. <clears throat> Thank you. In the interest of, uh, I have a number of responses, but in the interest of uh, deference <clears throat> to my colleagues who are waiting to ask questions, I'm going to turn to Senator Carper. Mr. Chairman, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for bringing us uh, together here, here to uh, today. Uh, Mr. Dunn, uh, Mr. Price, it's good to see you. Thank you for, for your time and for your, uh, your input. Um, as the former uh, chairman of the committee, this, this committee, Homeland Security Committee, <coughs> and as uh, actually the ranking member of this subcommittee that's gathered here today, um, I hope that this is the first of a number of hearings that will provide our, our colleagues uh, an opportunity to work together on a range of issues that will benefit the, uh, the American people. Uh, Mr. Dunn, Mr. Price, uh, again, we thank you for joining us in, in an effort to shine some light on a topic that's generated a whole lot of interest. And uh, not just uh, from con Congress, but, but from sports fans and concerned citizens uh, here at home and probably beyond our borders. Um, the proposed uh, framework agreement between the PGA Tour and Saudi-based uh, public investment fund uh, is a complex issue that will likely impact the game of professional golf for a long time, maybe <coughs> decades to, uh, to come, and may set a precedent for other sports professional uh, leagues here in the United States. Uh, I'm aware that there are probably more questions than answers at this uh, early stage, but I'm glad that uh, we have an opportunity to uh, start asking them to uh, today. Um, I go back and forth on the train uh, most nights to Doha. It's an easy train ride, about an hour and a half. And uh, my wife and I live there. And uh, we uh, oftentimes, she'll say to me, like, what are y'all doing today? What are you working on today? And at the end of the day, we'll go, well, what happened? And uh, she, uh, she'll ask me, I'm sure when I get home tonight, well, what did you uh, work on today? And uh, she's from North Carolina. She was born in North Carolina. I was born in uh, West Virginia. And uh, an unlikely place to have uh, an interest in golf, I would say. But there was a golfer there named Sammy Sneed, <laughs> who was before there was Jack Nicholas, before <coughs> there was Arnold Palmer. There was Sammy Sneed. He was bigger than life in, uh, in the, the state of West Virginia, where uh, my sister and I were, were born. Later, we'd live in a place called Danville, Virginia. And uh, uh, my dad uh, would actually take me with him to, uh, to not to play golf, but to caddy. And they'd have a foursome to play every couple of weeks and weekends. And, and I would get to caddy and make a few, a few dollars. And one day, the, uh, one of the, the foursome didn't show up. And my dad said, how would you like to play golf? I was like 12 years old. And uh, they, uh, I, I got to use his clubs. Uh, they were, uh, when I stood beside the golf clubs, they were as tall as me. And, uh, and he made me count every stroke. Uh, I shot that day at 214. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, but I was encouraged by the, my dad and the others who were playing golf that day. And he said, they, uh, they thought I might have set some kind of record, which is probably true. Uh, but uh, the next time I played, I, I cut 65 strokes off my, off my score. Good trend. I could only do better. I could only do better. But they, uh, 
they were talks my and the, the foursome, including my dad, that uh, I I was marked for greatness. The, the second <laughs> Sam, second Sammy Sneed, that was uh, not to uh, to happen. Still, I enjoy the the game of golf, and I know uh, Mr. Price, Mr. Dunn, and I I know uh, that you uh, love the game of golf as as well. I I think that you and the, the PGA Tour can be proud of the values of the tour and the charitable mission of, uh, of the tour. And in, in your testimony, I think you both state that the PGA Tour has contributed millions, millions of dollars to charities local uh, where the tournaments uh, are, are played, including uh, in Wilmington, Delaware, which uh, hosted uh, just last year the BMW Championship. And on the <clears throat> LPGA side, we hosted for many, many years uh, the uh, P Ladies PGA uh, Championship right. in, in Delaware. and, <clears throat> and uh, raised a whole lot of money for a very good cause uh, there in our state, too. Um, I'm told that the, uh, the Evans Scholar, Scholars Foundation in, um, in uh, Delaware, which provides tuition and housing assistance for low-income college students who work as caddies, uh, and they've received uh, uh, additional funding thanks to um, the, uh, the effort that we're talking about here today. And I am grateful for the support that your organization has lent to our state and to countless uh, others. Having said that, um, let me just say I'm concerned, as I'm sure you are too, that Saudi Arabia's human rights record runs counter to the tour's stated values of inclusion and respect. And uh, my, my question, in, in, as a result, I have one, just maybe one question for both of you, but are you concerned that the proposed framework agreement will provide the Saudi Arabian government the opportunity to hide its human rights record behind the tour's values. Also, I know that uh, my colleague, I think our chairman, uh, Senator uh, Chairman Blumenthal, may, I may have touched on this um, uh, issue earlier during the, uh, the hearing. But if the proposed framework agreement becomes finalized, can you definitively, I'll just say, can you definitively tell us that the PGA Tour and its players will be able to speak freely about the human rights record of Saudi Arabia. Thank you, Senator. And yes, I can tell you that if the framework agreement, if we move from a framework agreement to a definitive agreement, our players will be freely able to speak about Saudi Arabia. The PGA Tour fully supports uh, human rights uh, we support, you know, complete access to our game from all individuals, whether they're participating or attending our events. And the only way we will move forward with a definitive agreement, if the PGA Tour is in complete control and our tournaments continue to be operated in accordance with our mission and our values, which includes uh, operating for our players, but also the charity, as you so appropriately mentioned with the BMW championship that was conducted in Wilmington last year. All right, thank you. Mr. Dunn, you want to add anything to that? Senator, I, I completely, obviously, support both what you said and what Ron said. Uh, critical is this, in this framework agreement and the hope towards the definitive agreement is the control. And we absolutely agree with what you said, and we, 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 wouldn't, we wouldn't go ahead with, I mean, it's not gonna get any support without it. All right, thank you both. My time's expired, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Carper. Uh, I'll recognize colleagues for a second round um, if you wish to use the time. Senator Marshall. Th thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and Senator Carper, thank you for your thoughtful questions as always and the wisdom that you always pass on, pass on. I want to go back to the antitrust issue just, just for a second. I'm, I'm not a, an attorney. I'm a, uh, trying to understand the process, but it's my understanding the tour, the PGA Tour was under some type of an antitrust issue uh, investigation. As you were going forward, what type of advice were your attorneys giving you if you did this merger? Is it going to increase or decrease your risk of exposure to an antitrust issue? Mr. Price. Thank you, Senator. Uh, yes, we, uh, we, we were undergoing an investigation with regard to our regulations uh, and how they applied to the players that we had suspended who joined the Live Golf League. Uh, we, we, we have been notified that 
the um, antitrust regulators are also going to look at our framework agreement, uh, and we, you know, we plan to fully cooperate with with that investigation. But we do see this: uh, if we're able to move from a framework agreement to a definitive agreement, it's going to heal a fracture in golf. The fracture in golf could have led to less fan interest and, uh, you know a decreased product and opportunities for all professional golfers. We think as a result but my of- My question is, will this increase or decrease your, your antitrust uh, risk? Is that what the attorneys are, are giving you any advice, this the, merger? We're, 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 the, the, the regulators are certainly taking a look at it. Uh, we, we believe that it should not uh, violate the antitrust rules, but we plan to fully cooperate with, with, uh, with that investigation. Thank you, Mr. Price. Let me go to Mr. Dunn at Dunn again. Would it be fair to say that some golf venues benefit from the traditional PGA Tour and another golf venues were, were uh, benefiting from the new live tournaments going on? Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I want to make sure I understand. Your, you, so definitely where the PGA Tour is, the local communities, as, as Senator Blumenthal talked about in, in Connecticut, they, they by intention, design, right. total focus, they will definitely benefit. Uh, and the same is true for the live, live uh, venues as well, that those venues were making money. I, I think they get paid money. I, I don't know if the crowds are quite the same. Right. As you all were concerned about live going forward, was there any any particular venues that that were often talked about that there was concern about where the live was playing or or any type of you know money concerns from the the venue locations you are asking me senator Dunn, uh, yes. uh, that that never came up in any single discussion that i ever had with anyone but i'm not privy to every discussion but there was no discussion about coveting or not desiring any live Everything was about our players, our fans, our sponsors. How, how can we get to a, something that will work for everybody? We, we never discussed their, where they play. We, we don't, you know. Mr. Price, were there any discussions at your level about concern where the live venues were and going forward where these venues might be? No, sir. Certainly nothing I was aware of. I, I agree with Jimmy in that the focus was on live and what they were doing to try to recruit our players. And they're your, they're your players. Yes. Well, they're former PGA Tour members, and so they were our players before they left to go join Liv. Okay. Do they, are they co contractors for you all? Do they work for you all? Do they? They are independent contractors, um, so they can, you know, they, they don't have to play in all of our events, but our regulations, you know, stipulate that uh, they can't play for a competing league unless they get a conflicting event release. Okay. These players did not. These are regulations where membership organization, those are regulations that were developed by the members themselves. And so they're free to go pay for another league. They just can't go back and forth. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll close with this on a, on a positive note, Mr. Dunn. Yes, sir. I, I feel your compassion, your passion we never met before, but your compassion for this game of golf. Tell me, tell me why. Why do you love this game? What's important to you about it? It's a, it's a good question, Senator. Um, you know, you have your faith, your family, and your friends, and, and golf has made a huge difference in my life. Uh, my father always talked about there were three important things. Number one, get to the best college you could get into. Two, marry the right woman, and three, get good enough at golf so you weren't scared to death on the first tee. And uh, that's, other than health, faith, family, friends, that's, if you do that, it'll be all right. And I've made so many friends and been into so many situations, uh, in, <laughs> including today, <laughs> uh, less, less enjoyable, but, uh, but, uh, but, but it is an experience. And, uh, and I'm a very proud American, and I know it's not ideal, but I'm pretty proud to be in front of senators. And, uh, the game of golf is, uh, it's hard to really dislike somebody you play golf with. And I think golf is a global sport. We're reaching out to all parts of the world. And 
I think the more people that do it, the better chance we have for a better world. Senator Hawley is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Price, I just want to come back to the answers that you gave me regarding PGA Tour in China and make sure that I understand where this rests currently, what the current status is. So let's see if I've got the facts right. In, in 2018, the PGA Tour announced a 20-year agreement for a new entity called PGA Tour China Series, 20-year, 20-year agreement. This is what your spokesperson said about it just as recently as last year, 2022. Quote, the PGA Tour established a separate entity based in Beijing, China. Continuing, the PGA Tour series China is owned and operated by the PGA Tour and supported by the General Administration of Sport of China, that's the Chinese government, and the China Golf Association. Now, you're telling me that this entity no longer exists? Senator, I would have to get the facts for you on PGA Tour of China. I can give well, you... Well, I thought you I, said to me just a little bit ago, I thought you said that it, it, you did one event in 2019 and it, it doesn't exist anymore. I, from, from an event standpoint, that series has not operated since 2019. Because of COVID. It, in, it, it has not operated because of COVID, and we have no plans to continue that tour. Be because of COVID? Because just as recently as last year, you had events scheduled in China. You had to ultimately cancel them because of COVID, but that doesn't sound to me like you've suspended your business arrangements. I, I, would have, I would have to check the status of the contract, Senator, but it's my understanding we have no well, No, no, just wait a minute, though. This, this is important yeah. because you told me just a minute ago when I talked about PJ Tour Series China, that that wasn't happening, that that, 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 was, that was gone. But now you're telling me something different. Now you're telling me that, oh, no, we still have the business arrangement. Actually, you're hemming and hawing on that. But you're saying we haven't done any events in China. Well, of course not, because of COVID restrictions. You haven't been allowed to. I'm trying to ascertain whether you still have this 20-year agreement with Chinese entities to do tour events in China. You had PGA Tour officials living in China in order to facilitate this. Do, do you see what I'm driving at? So, so my question is, does PGA Tour China, this entity that the tour owns based in Beijing for which you've signed a 20-year contract, do you, does it still exist? I can, I can tell you two things. One is I would have to check the status of the contract. I do not believe it's currently in force, but I would have to check that. And we'll, we'll be happy to get you information on that. The second thing I can tell you is that we haven't operated since 2019, and it's my understanding that we have <laughs> no plans to continue that series. As long as COVID exists or? or... Period. And why, why is that? Be, from a business standpoint, we're, we're, it, it, we're not going to continue that series in China. Okay. Here's... I think you can see what my concerns are, but just so that I'm absolutely crystal clear about it, here, here's my concern. Yes. My concern is that the communist government in China has systematically attempted to use and influence American sports organizations and lots of other entities, our media, entertainment industry, companies, lots of them. They're not shy about using leverage. And we we've used the term sports washing a lot today. I think it's applicable on this situation. And Senator Blumenthal referenced earlier the brutal crackdown in Hong Kong, which I had, I guess I'll call it the privilege. Uh, maybe it's um, the misfortune of seeing for myself firsthand on the streets there. And while that was going on, what was China doing? What was Beijing doing? They were applying maximal pressure on the NBA that had a lot of contracts, very lucrative with China. The chairman mentioned Daryl Morey at the time, general manager of the Houston Rockets, who ventured the most frankly, anodyne statement in support of the people of Han Hong Kong. I mean, it was, it was the most moderate little, I think it was a tweet. For this, he was blasted by NBA players, certainly by China, by owners, by his own owner. Ultimately, he resigned. So it worries me when I see the PGA doing business with the Chinese government, subjecting its players and this association that you've lauded so much today to those same pressures from a government that is brutal, that is repressive, and that is attempting to use American institutions as a megaphone for their own totalitarian, dystopian, 
and frankly evil policies. When you imprison millions of people in concentration camps for the purpose of eradicating their religious beliefs and killing them, and that's what they're doing with the Uyghurs, you're an evil regime. When you treat your own people as slaves, and that's what they're doing, you are an evil regime. I don't want to see American institutions co-opted by that regime. That's where I'm coming from with this. I, I would hope we'd share that perspective. So I look forward to your responses in writing as to the status of your business agreement. I, I continue to be interested as to why on your Form 990 in both 2018 when this deal was announced and in 2020 after your event, this wasn't disclosed. I'd like to know why that is. And uh, I'd like your assurances that um, your commitment that you're not going to restart this series in China and you're not going to conduct business operations with millions of dollars in financing from Chinese entities. Will you give me that commitment? Senator, be happy to give you the information on the status of our contract in China. Uh, and I'll certainly follow up with you with regard to the disclosures in the 990. You know, as I've stated, we, we have... Uh, we have no intentions of con uh, continuing that series from, you know, from, from my perspective. Uh, and that's, that's, and I, you know, I can't commit the tour for the long term. That's, I, I'm not in a position to do that. But there's, you know, nothing in the sh short term or immediate future that from a tournament standpoint that we're considering doing in China. I would just say finally, Mr. Chairman, that uh, I think that the era in which institutions Sports leagues, businesses, when they say it with regard to communist China that, well, we just we leave the politics to other people. We just don't take any position on issues. I, I think that time has passed. When you have a government that is as oppressive and imperial as that government is and is doing to its people what that government is and has designs to do to others around the world what that government wants to do, I think it's time for American companies, American institutions to stand up and be counted. And I hope that the PGA will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Hawley. And Thank that you. is exactly why we're here today. That is why we are conducting this investigation and why we will broaden it as appropriate to include other institutions and other repressive regimes and their potential impact on our institutions, whether it's corporations or sports organizations. And I would just say, uh, you know, recently at the Qatar World Cup, uh, FIFA prohibited players from wearing armbands with rainbow flags. Uh, we don't know whether Qatar imposed this requirement on FIFA or FIFA just wanted to avoid controversy when it made its own deal with a repressive government, but the effect had a ban on free expression. This effort to restrict, punish, torture, imprison, kill people who stand up for their beliefs is a growing worldwide phenomenon. And I would hope that it would unite us on a bipartisan basis. Can you commit, uh, Mr. Price, that the tour would never agree to a similar restriction if Saudi Arabia, which has a particularly troubling record on LGBTQ rights, wanted you to do it. Senator, we believe in full uh, access to our events uh, from a participation standpoint, from an attendance standpoint. We don't believe in any restrictions on that. Uh, if we, if we so reach... Is the answer yes? Senator, we would... We you, control would you would never agree to it. You would never punish your players. You would reject Saudi Arabia or the governor of the Sovereign Wealth Fund if they sought to impose that restriction. And you would never impose it yourself. We would never impose it, and we, and we determine where our events are played, and we would not conduct tournaments under those rules. So you wouldn't do it in Saudi Arabia? If it, not according to those rules. Uh, let me ask you, um, I mentioned earlier the side agreement, the apparent side agreement involving Greg Norman. Was that ever executed? No, sir. Is it your understanding that there is an agreement that he will no longer have his present position? That's in the talking points that you prepared for Mr. Monaghan. Yes, sir. Under, under the framework agreement, if we are able to move to a definitive agreement and it's approved, 
the LiveGolf assets, for which Greg Norman is currently the commissioner, will move into a new subsidiary, PGA Tour subsidiary, controlled by the PGA Tour. And those events will be managed by the PGA Tour. We have a complete infrastructure in place to manage events. Uh, it would make no sense to, 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 to bring in uh, that type of an executive to manage what is now a 14 series of events. So just to be clear, he's out of a job. If we reach a definitive agreement, we would not have a requirement for that type of position. Uh, our review of internal documents indicates that there are other understandings and agreements. Uh, would you tell us about them? I'm not aware of any other understanding or agreements that, that's not reflected in the framework agreement, which, well, is, which is still to be negotiated. Everything is to be negotiated. Well, what, are the, what are the other side agreements or informal understandings? I'm, I'm not aware of any other side agreements or informal understanding. Is that because you're not permitted to talk about them or because there are none absolutely? There none exist to my knowledge. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, uh, when were you first informed about these negotiations that have been described by Mr. Dunn and the documents? Senator Commissioner Monaghan uh, informed me shortly before the London meeting that there was, that, that there may, we might in, have an opportunity to engage with the public investment fund to settle the litigation and potentially to establish a framework where the PGA Tour would be in a position to continually uh, professional golf. Were any of the other independent directors on the board informed about the conversations or negotiations? Senator, uh, our director, Jimmy Dunn, was obviously aware. And I'm putting, I should have been clearer, aside from Mr. Dunn, who was involved in the negotiations. Our, our board chair, Ed Hurley, he was aware of the, of the negotiations. By the way, with respect to Mr. Hurley, he, he is the co-chairman of Wachtell Lipton? Yes. Were they involved in providing legal advice? Yes. Were they representing you or advising you in the litigation? Yes. Uh, Mr. Dunn, you've been involved with business governance for, I would say, decades. Um, is it common to keep these kinds of negotiations secret from a corporation's governing body? It strikes me as remarkable. Senator, every negotiation, every deal has its own rhythm. Uh, this, this framework agreement settled the litigation, and then said, we're going to keep talking. We were really afraid that once the other side's lawyers learned anything about it, it would be poof, gone. But most and corporations trust their boards of directors. In fact, they're intimately involved. They're informed. One of your board has resigned because of this breach of common trust and practice. Wouldn't you say this is pretty unique in your experience? What I would say, Senator, was that the conversations, I think, were fragile. And I, and I really felt that on the Saturday, I guess it's Memorial Day, I thought they were over, frankly. And uh, we did have a discussion earlier on where I mentioned to, uh, to the chairman and to the commissioner, I said, that, you know, we, we ought to do this, and, and, the, and the chairman said that the, that's the commissioner's decision, and the commissioner said, we'll decide when we decide. And uh, my understanding is he had the authority to sign the agreement, which is simply a, terminates the lawsuit, and then with the knowledge that everything else was going to have to be discussed after that. Now, that, that's, that's all I can say about that. That's all I know about that. But you would agree that most
corporations, most executives, CEOs feel a duty. In fact, I would argue that legally as well as morally, they have a duty to keep their boards of directors informed. Why this near unique secrecy with your own board of directors? Simply you didn't trust them. You know, Senator, I, I've been to two board meetings. <laughs> I started in, I, I, my, I, I, start, I started in January. So I, I, I was not an expert on the dynamic of the board, very honestly. The bed was on fire when you got into it. No, Liv put us on fire. Liv, well, Liv put us in, a, in an, um, an incredibly difficult position. Liv was a constant every day, who's gonna go? It, it, was, it was very disruptive. I'm gonna come back to Liv's disruptive effect uh, when I return. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to vote uh, we have a vote ongoing right now, and I apologize. I will have some additional questions. When I come back, I'm going to turn to the ranking member, and uh, I'll be back. We're, we're in the middle of a vote right now. I'll be back within a matter of a few minutes. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before you go, I mean, did the board object to the fact that the lawsuit was dismissed? Did, did, I mean, once it was finally revealed, did anybody on the board say, hey, this is awful. We, we should continue to engage in this legal action. <laughs> the the only uh, uh, the one no no they did not. Uh, the the reality was, uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Stevenson described it to me as like that. This is just a litigation settlement. There's really not much to this. That's what. But he was not happy about not knowing about it. I. I and again, you we got to ask can, him. We can emphasize again, there is no deal. There's no deal. There's no agreement. There's a settlement of the lawsuit, and we're talking, and we're trying, trying to see if we could do something that makes sense for our players, sponsors, fans. That's what we're trying to do. Really hard. And this is not making it any easier. I mean, let's, let's be honest. This is not making your job any easier. Well... If, if you're addressing me, Senator, you know, it, Ron is doing the negotiation and the fact, Price. You know, but it, he being here in Washington, worrying about this, consumed with this, it, no, it's making it a lot harder, a lot, lot harder. So, I mean, I, I can say some things, but the chairman's not here to <laughs> hear them. Um, but, but I'll say them anyway. From my viewpoint, I don't see the PGA is doing anything wrong here. And unfortunately, from some of my colleagues, the, the, the line of their questioning implies that there's something nefarious or something wrong, or that you, you violated, you know, for example, your duty to the board. Um, can you just address that? Mr. Price, we'll start with you. Th thank you, Senator. Uh, no, certainly from our point of view, uh, we, we faced an existential threat, as you indicated earlier. We, our sole purpose was to preserve was to was to preserve our existence so that we could continue to benefit our constituents, our players, and charity, and our ability to continue to lead professional golf. And as a result, uh, get in a position of where Live Golf was not leading professional golf and controlling golf for its operations. And the you know the negotiations were confidential. Uh, so that surprised a lot of people, and uh, that was, you know, unfortunate that we had to surprise people, but it was necessary. Uh, as Jimmy has said, or otherwise, the deal would, we would have not have got, we would not have been able to reach an agreement. And by the way, I, I fully understand that had the other side's lawyers gotten wind of this, that, again, that they would have seen, you know, a bunch of legal fees just going up in smoke, right? And they would have done everything possible to tank the dismissal of the lawsuit. Because there's no deal. There's a framework. But the only thing definitive is you were able to get that legal liability off your plate. Correct? That's correct, Senator. Now, now there have been an awful lot of questions and, and comments. And, and you've been asked to give us different assurances in terms of what the PGA do or, tour will do or won't do. Um, 
I want to give you the opportunity, well, nobody else here at the dais, <laughs> describe what the tour actually is, you know, who, who your duty is to, um, you know, what, what your duty is not. I mean, obviously, you're, you're human beings, you don't like to see repressive regimes. Um, from a business standpoint, you've got a way, if you involve yourself in a country that's doing things that maybe your fan base wouldn't approve of, I mean, you'd have to certainly, you know, factor that into your decision whether or not you hold a, a tournament somewhere or not. Correct. Um, you know, Mr. Dunn, you, you talked about, I think very convincingly, that, you know, you love this game of golf. You think that golf can help repair, repair breaches, right? Yes. Can, 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 well, talk, talk, talk a little bit about just the game of golf being able to use globally. Uh, again, we talked about meritocracy. There doesn't make any difference what kind of race you are, what, you know, literally, it doesn't make any difference. If you can shoot a lower score than anybody else, you're going to be competing at the highest level. But just talk about what you think the game of golf can do for the world. Well, you know, I, I, I'm very, uh, very jaded on this, but I have a tremendous, tremendous respect and appreciation and love for the game of golf. Uh, just in the world, world prospect, and I know there's been a lot of discussion about 9-11 and, and involvement, but there's, you know, there's 30, if you look at even in Saudi Arabia, I think there are 18 million men and young men, men and Saudi women that are under the age 32. And it, I think it would be good if they didn't think every American hated them, you know, because they had absolutely nothing to do with, with, with 9-11. And I think that golf can be a force throughout the world. Uh, now, in complete, with respect to that, Senator, we would not be negotiating with them. You know, they wouldn't have been the first pick. But first of all, we didn't need money. You, you, you didn't choose. No, no, no. We 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 got to the table because of the situation at hand, which is the vulnerability to the tour. And the tour, one thing that's really come out and it's very important, is you know the top fifty at the tour at that moment are critical to to the to the viability of the tour and what it will be going forward. So if you lose a number of those players, sponsors become very unhappy. Uh, you don't have the level of competition. We would like the best players playing against each other all the time. We'd like to be able to have that product, but still protect the inches of the tour. So there are just so many things that we could do correctly if we could if we could have the game united uh, in level of competition. I think the competition could go up so level, the interest could go up so much, and you could see situations like it wasn't a tour event, but in the U.S. Open. Now, you know, a, a guy won that tournament that it was amazing how, how he was able to do that. And uh, it's just something special but I, but and unique. I, but I would say... And again, it was just fun watching Wyndham Clark. Oh, he was awesome. Okay, I mean, just he's got to keep it all together oh. until he sinks that final putt, and then you see the tension flow out of him. But th the fact of the matter is, had it would be, had it been a bunch of players whose nobody knew their name, it might have been the U.S. Open. People st still might have yeah. tuned in. But if it had been another tournament, you wouldn't have had the viewership, you wouldn't have had the audience, you wouldn't have had the revenue, you wouldn't have attracted the sponsor, and Week in and week out, if that's what the PGA Tour looks like, just it would be a bad. lesser tour, you know, without the stars, and that hurts everybody, everybody in the games of golf, except for the Saudis who have an unlimited bank account that want to buy their, their way into the game of golf. I mean, that, that's the reality you faced. You know, Senator, I've, I've competed in business my whole life, uh, and, and generally there are economic principles that make sense that you have to apply. And, and within that framework, you better get smarter, you better get tougher, you've got to get more knowledgeable, you've got to work harder, you've got to do all the things that frankly have made America great. This situation is different. You know, you just, you, you, you know, to make, to give a charity $50 million, it takes a lot of work to create that. It's a, it's a, it's a very different deal here. And, and, and if you, 
Well, let, let, let's, you know, Ms. Price, let, let's talk about the progression of the game of golf. I mean, the stars of yesteryear made a fraction of yes. what stars today are, right? Correct. So I'd like to, the 1.5 billion, I mean, the, you know, people use that term like that's just a lot of money, and it is, but that's revenue. You have expense behind that. Correct. Okay, so talk about how the 1.5 million in general, I mean, just, you know, gross terms, how you generate the 1.5 million revenue, you know, the TV revenue, you know, what, what you get from tournaments when you sanction the events. I mean, just tell us a little bit how you, you know, what the revenue stream is, how difficult it is to bring in that revenue st stream year in and year out, how you've grown that over the decades, you know, how prize money has increased, and, you know, quite honestly, how you had to increase dramatically the prize money to retain the players under the threat of live. I mean, that, that also put the tour's ability to fund this stuff at risk, but just gets, kind of describe the business yeah, model. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Senator. Our, our business model is predicated on media revenues and sponsorship revenues. And that drives over 80% of our, our gross revenues. We have some other form of revenues, you know, uh, missions, hospitalities, at tournaments, licensing revenues, our tournament players clubs, but it's primarily predicated on media and sponsorship. And by the way, the same media could, could pay for uh, viewership rights for the other tours. Correct. Right? Yes. And they do to a certain extent, but not at the level that the PGA Tour garners. That's, that's correct. And, you know, and they're, they're trusting us when they enter into those agreements that we're going to deliver uh, a, you know, an excellent field of players to them and it's going to include uh, our top players or a strong representation of our top players. And so we've had some loyal players. We've, we've had a strong group of loyal players that have remained with us and we're very proud of that. And as we talked about earlier, we're gonna make sure those players are recognized. But if Liv stays in existence and continues to take our top players from us, that will put pressure on our ability to retain those media revenues and those sponsorship revenues. They could decline in the future if Liv, that's, that is the existential threat. And if they decline, it declines the earnings opportunities not only for those top players, but for all players. That's 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 the threat that we faced, and that's what we're trying to work through. Yeah, again, yeah, that's the existential threat the yes, tour sir. still faces. And you need to understand that this threat has not gone away. That's if correct. We, you know, Mr. Dunn, what, just speculate. If you're not able to conclude this deal, and by the way, this thing has to be concluded by the end of this year, correct? Or else, again, the lawsuits aren't reinitiated. That's correct. But Liv can, you know, once again, re-engage in trying to attract more and more players and continue to, to build their tour at the expense of the PGA Tour. I mean, you just kind of talk about what's going through the players' minds right now. Well, I, understandably, the players were shocked, and the, 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 the real problem was the initial announcement. What, what, what should have been said is, Liv and the PGA Tour have agreed to settle their lawsuits. <clears throat> they're, 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 they're terminated with prejudice, so we win, we win those cases. And they agree to, to have discussions where, uh, where, where um, uh, PIF could be a, an investor, a minority investor in an ongoing, potentially an ongoing but entity. That would have been great. Just real quick though, you didn't really have a choice whether or not you could announce this. I mean, you. The lawsuits are going to be dismissed. That's going to be a public court filing. Right. So you had to make an announcement. Well, we, you we kind of acknowledge the fact that you maybe didn't make the announcement the way you would have liked. So people started speculating. That's right. Like you had a hard deal here, um, but you don't have a hard deal. We have not. We have no, no agreement. We have a, 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 we have an ag we have agreement to possibly get to an agreement. So I think every the way it was announced, which was really bad. Okay. Everybody jumped to a conclusion, maybe even this body, that you know they're selling to the. We're, you know, we're not, you know, and but we are really trying to figure out the right thing to do for our players and 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 the global game of golf. And by the way, we, we'll try hard to get an agreement. And 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 I'm I'm not I'm hopeful that we will. If we don't, you know, we'll have to we'll have to go through some other 
we'll have to accept that, that we're going to have to go back and compete, and we'll have to do it, and we'll do it. By the way, I've, yeah, I've got a great deal of interest in this, and so I've been following the news pretty carefully. I, I've certainly sensed a softening, at least by some players, after they got over the initial shock, when they start realizing the situation you're in and, you know, how you're trying to preserve, preserve what's in their best interest, you know, the, the game of golf. Well, Is that well, they, they said that sunlight is the greatest disinfectant. I mean, that w when the facts come out, and, you know, in hindsight, I wish we had put the, and we couldn't because you're not allowed to do it, but I wish we had put the agreement out day one and everybody could see that there's no there there. Right. And, and, and I, think, I think, Ron, you might have said at the player meeting we were both at in, uh, in uh, a couple weeks ago in Connecticut, that if we had just announced what it was, we, it, would have been, it would have been fine. But, Correct. you know, I'll, I'll t everybody's to blame for that. I'll take my share of blame for that, too. I, I wouldn't beat up on yourself too bad on that. There's been a lot made of that tentative disparagement clause. Um, first of all, you know, Mr. Dunn, you, you've done a lot of deals. That's, that's not unusual to it, have it, an anti-disparagement clause in any agreement, right? You know, Senator, it, it is very common because it's hard to get an agreement with someone if you're saying bad things about them while you're by the pendency of the agreement. I, I understand the sensitivity to it, and I think it's worth, worth consideration, and I, I applaud Senator Blumenthal for raising it, because, you know, we, in this country, we believe in free speech, and we do. This has a very short term. If we'll get to a deal, terrific. If we don't, it, it's gone. By the way, there's and, nothing the PGA Tour can do to bind players to a disparagement. Kind. I mean, they, they've got freedom of speech, correct? I'm not even sure there's anything you can do to bind certain members of the board. I mean, you might be able to bind the organization not from issuing public releases. I mean, Mr. Price, what, what is your understanding of really what, what would be the enforceability of any dis anti -disparag or disparagement clause? We do not plan to enforce anything against Absolutely. our players for spe speaking their mind. They're free to speak their mind. But again, I mean, how enforceable would it be against any member of the board or individuals as opposed to the organization? I'm, you know, I'm not an attorney, but, you, you know, I, I would think board members are free to speak their mind. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I just took this opportunity to give the the representatives of the PGA here, a little chance to once again uh, highlight the reality situations, some of their business model, you know, how they generate revenue, how crucial it is that they're able to retain the top players and this thing doesn't splinter off to uh, two separate tours. I thought they did a good job doing that, so I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Senator Johnson. Um, you know, uh, thinking a little bit about some of your responses on the way over to vote, and back, uh, first, uh, thanks to Mr. Dunn for understanding uh, the concerns that I have Appreciate. raised. Uh, I guess my feeling is uh, these are concerns about free expression. They're concerns about the players and about your fans, about the game that you so dearly love. Isn't it better to have these concerns aired before you're locked into an agreement? You know, S Senator Blue, I'm a, I'm a grateful American citizen. If you, you ask me to come and see, I'm, I'm going to come and answer all your questions. Uh, uh, yeah, wh whatever you say, I I'm happy to answer any questions and, and, and work as the best I can to, to, go, to, to help the PGA Tour and help the game of golf and help, help what we're doing. Better to know what the concerns of the American people are before you are straightjacketed and locked into an agreement that may, in fact, unfairly and even illegally bind you, your players, sponsors, and others. Senator Blumen there, we appreciate everybody's interest and appreciate your, your involvement, and, and, and thank you. By the way, I cited the statement by John Rahm. Um, I think the general feeling I'm quoting is that a lot of people feel a bit of betrayal from management. Have other players, Mr. Price, expressed those kinds of concerns to you? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Due to the confidential nature of the settling the litigation and signing the framework agreement, that we surprised, we surprised a lot of people we, including our players. So we've had a lot of work to do 
to make sure that our players understand what we did and why we did it. They're very interested in that. Our players are starting to understand why we did it. They're start, and they're starting to see the significant benefits for them and the game of golf and all of our, all of our constituents if we can move from the framework agreement to the definitive agreement, but they're still very interested in the terms. They want to make sure we're in control. Have you received anything in writing from any of the players? I have not personally received well, anything. Well, has the PGA Tour received anything in writing from any of the players? I don't see everything that goes to our other executives, so I, I can't. Are you aware of communications in writing from your players? We understand there have been. There certainly could have been, yes, because there play, could have players been. were surprised. Have you seen any? No, I, I don't recall seeing any. Have you right. heard about any? Uh, you know, I, I've heard about a lot of discussions about players being surprised. Could you make them available to this committee? If there, if there are written communications, we certainly will make those available. Thank you. Um, what would you say to the players who feel blindsided and betrayed? Thank you, Senator. It's what we have been saying. We've been explaining why the negotiations had to be confidential and what the benefits were to entering into the framework agreement. And most, a, a lot of players, not, not all, are beginning to understand exactly why we had to do it and how this would be beneficial for them and charity and all of our constituents. They're beginning to understand. Yes, sir. All of them? Not, not all. We still, we still have some work to do. Uh, not, not all players agree on everything. We're, we're a big membership organization, and we represent how a many, lot of different players. How many players did you notify in advance of reaching the agreement? I, I don't believe any players were None? notified. No, sir. Not a single player was notified? You're a membership organization. Your members are the players. You don't exist without the players, but you didn't tell a single one of them? about the negotiations, let alone what the result would be before you announced it publicly? It was, it was a, the settlement of litigation, which was binding, and, and then we have told the players that we would go through a process of making them fully involved in anything we do relative to the definitive agreement, which we're in the process of doing. Mr. Dunn, uh, you said in an interview I think it was last year, uh, quote, if someone is willing to pay incredibly uneconomic prices, they will be unbelievably disruptive, end quote. You said that, I believe, correct? Senator, I, I have the full faith that, that if you're saying it, it's right. I, I, I don't remember what it was a reference to, but it ma makes sense. Um, it seems to me that you were in effect saying there that the Saudis were willing to pay money without regard to the economic <clears throat> profit or revenue, correct? Correct. In other words, their interest was public image, sports washing, cleansing a reputation, correct? Senator. I can't speak to the mind of what their intent was, but I know if you have a lot of something, you tend to be a little sloppier about it. So if you have- They a, have a lot of money. They got a lot. I mean, a lot. And so when you have like, when it's like anything else, you, if, you, if you're down to your last 10 bucks, you watch it carefully if you got. And, and that's how they can be disruptive, because they got a lot of money, buckets full of money, correct? Because they I, don't I, have to care about the economic results. They're a total autocracy. They don't have to care about paying players. They'll just do it out of those buckets full of money, and that will continue with their dominant financial interests, their equity ownership of the PGA Tour through this profit-making entity that will control financially whatever the 
board of directors composition may be so just looking at it from the future standpoint you're not out of the woods they're going to continue to have this kind of bucket full of money and they're going to continue to kind of wield the influence that they do. That's the word that was used in the official documents. And whatever the good intentions and the rhetoric now, you still have to reach a deal. And so my hope is that you will resist those bucket full of money. I think a lot of players, a lot of sponsors, a lot of charities, and frankly, the 9-11 families are hoping that the PGA Tour will stand up and frankly avoid the sellout that this deal seems to be. Because that disruptive, uneconomic effect is exactly what we need to resist as a nation. If we're going to be selling out to countries that can throw around hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, we're going to lose. Not just financially, we're going to lose in terms of our democracy and freedom. And institutions like golf, sports are central to our society, to our culture, to our economy, to our way of life, to our self-image, and our image abroad. And for all the reasons that you have very eloquently described your love of golf, it can't exist as an institution in this country if people are not willing to stand up for it, just like other sports and other institutions. Uh, you know, the 9-11 families, a uh, number of them are here today, um, and uh, they've asked for a meeting with you. Would you commit to meet with them? Yes. And do you have anything maybe that you'd want to say to them now, as long as a number of them are here? Senator, I will say now what I said on September 12th of 01, what I said to my children growing up. Anyone remotely involved, anyone tangentially involved, anyone who profited, anyone who is involved, we should pursue them with extreme prejudice to the full extent, to the complete capacity. And over the years, I want to thank President Bush. I want to thank President o o Obama. I want, to I want to thank the magnificent United States military. I want to thank the special services that have executed that, that, that with prejudice. I honestly believe that our government, with both President Bush, President Obama, our military, and the brilliant, brilliant SEALs, did their job. And anyone that is involved with that thing has, has answered justice. I go on to say that with my own children, I thought it's been incredibly important to them to understand that because someone has the same skin color or the same religion as, those, as the people that were involved in the criminals that were involved in 9-11, that doesn't mean we hate them. That we're raised in the United States of America that has different values and we look at things differently. And when I grew up, in our house, we had a sign, no Irish need apply. And that was something my mother instilled us so that we just had a, a, a taste of what was, that, what was that like when because of religion or heritage, you, were, you, were, you didn't get something that you deserved. And I'm very proud that a friend of mine once said that my second son said that he had never ever heard me say one negative remark about any any Mid Middle Eastern, any Muslim religion, anything like that. And I'm very proud of that. 
I think America stands for something different. I think if someone does a crime, you go after them. For this crime, it's death. I, I absolutely I believe that our special services did their job, and I'm grateful to them, but I will refuse to describe a whole nother people because they had common religion or skin color. I'm not doing that under any condition. Thank you for those remarks. Um, you know, I, I want to make clear that uh, we're not here about the people of Saudi Arabia. We're here because the regime, an autocratic, repressive regime, is torturing, imprisoning, killing its own people. Because they are different, and because they express their views, or because they are women, and they have fostered the war in Yemen, and also, there is mounting evidence, I think persuasive evidence, that the Saudi government was complicit in the 9-11 attack. And the families who are here are seeking justice against that regime. And the materials you've just been handed, which also went to Senator Johnson, uh, I would suggest you have a look at. Uh, but the point is that the Senate actually has supported them. Uh, Senator Cornyn and I led the effort, it's called JASTA, to enable those families to go to court so that our courts would have jurisdiction in their quest for justice. We passed that bill and then we passed it again when President Obama vetoed it. Senator Cornyn and I led that effort. And the materials that you've been handed reflect a lack of cooperation from some of the agencies in our own government in providing information that those 9-11 families need seeking simple justice against Saudi Arabia. It's not the reason we're here today, but it reflects many of those reasons. So my hope is that you will support that effort of the families to seek justice. I'm Glad that you are committed to meet with them and uh, the, the passion that you've expressed in support of our military and our other security services because I think every member of the Senate shares those views and it ought to bring us together. Um, Senator Johnson, did you have any other okay. questions? My closing comments, first of all, is I, I do think this hearing has been constructive in a number of different ways. It's given the PGA Tour an opportunity to you know, describe the the rock and the hard place they they were in, between and still are in. Okay, uh, this has got a long way to go, but uh, mem many senators were able to express their concerns that I think uh, the PGA Tour shares. So I think that was good. Uh, I would push back on the term sellout. Um, this is, PGA Tour did not seek this. They, they were put in this position. Uh, the Saudis have the $700 billion. If they want to be involved in golf, they will be involved in golf. And if this thing fails, they can spend the money to take over golf. And I think that would be tragic, and I think it would destroy golf because it would destroy the competitive spirit and the purity of the competition. So I appreciate the dif difficult nature of, of you know, what you uh, – did Mr. Dunn, in first reaching out and starting it, I understand the difficult nature of your task ahead of you, Mr. Price, to conclude this negotiation. I really do hope that we can give them the, this time and space and the privacy, working with their members, now that the members are fully aware of uh, where they're going, to, to conclude this deal. And I think there's a real potential here. Again, this has been negotiated by somebody who, I guess, other than losing a direct member of the family, I mean, losing 40% of your colleagues is, is no small thing. You understand the full sensitivities. I don't think Mr. Dunn would be involved with people that had any involvement whatsoever. So I, I trust his judgment from that standpoint. 
And I, I hope we can, I guess, trust these individuals to do right by their members, by this country, uh, by the 9-11 families, try and preserve the game of golf, competition at the, the highest levels, and see if we can't forge some kind of win-win situation where, where even the citizens of Saudi Arabia can enjoy greater freedom, greater modernity, uh, where the game of golf can be used, as I know Mr. Dunn believes it really can be used, to, to bridge divides and just improve the situation. So again, I, you know, uh, I wouldn't have held this hearing. I was highly interested in attending it and listening to it. I think some good has come of it. I think it's been constructive, so I appreciate that. And let, let's, let's give them the time and space to conclude a deal that can be actually a win-win situation for everybody involved. We appreciate your being here. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Uh, We've learned a lot, and we've also learned we need to learn more. And so we're going to continue this inquiry. We're going to ask that the other potential witnesses that we've invited actually come and share their perspectives and information. I assume you would support that effort. You're talking about Yasa and, and uh, yeah, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, the more we know, uh, the more we can support the values and freedoms that we have espoused here today and the ideals of professional golf and the PGA Tour, which we supported. I supported. When you asked me to meet in Cromwell, Connecticut, I was all in. Yes, you were. Thank you for that. And I will continue to support the PGA Tour. Just make no mistake, as I said before, America is on your side. Mm -hmm. We will support you. It shouldn't be about the money, the disruption, the uneconomic offers. And so uh, I recognize that you can't say you're going to walk away from this deal, but I hope you bargain hard. And we will continue this inquiry because I think uh, uncovering more of the facts and shining a spotlight on what's really happening here is in the national interest and part of our obligation. Thank you very much. Thank this you, hearing is Thank you. going Thank to be, you both. is going to be adjourned and the record will remain open for two weeks for any written questions that are submitted, the responses to Senator Hawley and responses to other questions. And again, we're very grateful to you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.